All right, everyone, uh, we're going to get started soon because we really are crunched for time today. We have a lot of presenters and speakers. So if everyone would just find their seats. Um, if you're one of our guest commentators, we have some reserved seats up in the front so you can easily get to the, the panel. Awesome. Um, there should be a stash of chairs, um, maybe one of our... Oh, no, no, it's good. It's, we'd like everyone to have a seat. Yeah, try to fill in the tables. Tight quarters, tight timing. Okay. Looks like we have enough chairs, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for waking up early on a Friday and coming to Designing Justice. Um, on behalf of the team that helped organize this, we are just so excited that this is happening, and we're really excited to have such a great turnout. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name's Annie White. I'm a second-year MUP planning student, um, and I'll just give a brief introduction to the event today um, because we have a lot of amazing projects to discuss and amazing guests to hear from. So I've realized I've always gravitated toward places and people who act and design like they give a damn. This is why I fell in love with St. Louis. When you're there, the burning des desire that you feel of people trying to make the city a better place is palatable, which I think has been obvious over the past two days at the St. Louis conference. And while I was skeptical at first, this is also the reason why I now love the GSD. I'm consistently inspired by my friends and classmates, their passion for improving the lives of people in the cities in which we inhabit. This is the energy that we hope to highlight through Designing Justice. This is an organic, student-led organization that's hopefully this is just the first stop, the first step in a continuing pro project. It is so rare for us to hear from fellow students in different concentrations to hear about how they are thinking about social and racial conflicts and how, as designers, we can hope to create more equitable cities. Today we will hear from over 12 students who have been wrestling with the issues of justice in the built environment. We are so thankful to welcome our notable guest, Atiyah Martin, who will be giving the keynote speech after the first panel, and David Harvey and Killian Riano. They will be speaking and giving guest commentary after the student panels during the discussion time. We would also like to thank the faculty, Stephen Gray, Dan Dioka, Diane Davis, and others who both supported this event but who continuously hold the GSD responsible for bringing issues of social, ju social justice into the curriculum, into the consciousness of the department. And as students, we are deeply appreciative of that. But we would also like to thank the students who made the decision that whether it was in the curriculum or not, they were going to bring these issues to the forefront of their academic and professional projects. Now, Lindsay Woodson and Marcus Mello will further introduce the concept of designing justice. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Marcus Mello. I am a third year student here. I'm in the architecture and urban planning program, uh, and I helped to co lead um, the Map the Gap project with Lindsay. Um, um, I'm Lindsay Woodson. I am an MDES Master of Design Studies Risk and Resilience student and Master in Urban Planning. Um, I as well co-lead with Marcus and we're going to show you a couple projects um, oriented around designing justice, um, the first of which Map the Gap. Um, so we think it's really important to kind of begin this conversation um, and kind of big, piggyback off of the last two days to really define a couple topics. Um, so equity and equality are two different things. Um, we aren't saying or we aren't proposing that they're necessarily opposing issues, um, but they need to be fleshed out if we are to continue this conversation about defining um, justice. Um, and so if we look at um, different definitions of justice, um, I think it's important for, for not only the design school and designers to have a particular notion of justice, but to do it collaboratively and really include um, as many voices as we can. 
Um, so while these are the more kind of run of the mill definitions, I think that we are hoping to really start a conversation specifically around design. Um, and so we have been doing this um, within the African American Student Union that we're both a part of. Um, and this is a quick timeline of some of the events that we have put on throughout the last couple years. Um, I don't know if you want to go through this. Um, yeah, so our uh, activism and our uh, concern with design and, or uh, justice in the built environment really started uh, in November of 2014 um, after the failure to indict uh, Darren Wilson. Um, I think that was really the um, the the event that really got our student group uh, really just asking questions about equity and how we can, as designers, con con contribute to this overall uh, conversation. Um, from then on, uh, in 2015, uh, we helped to organize an informing justice panel, which was a great uh, collaborative event in Piper uh, Auditorium that brought together uh, different designers to really just push these different to push these different uh, conversations. Uh, forward. Uh, over the summer um, of 2015, um, we uh, did some research and, and really tried to ground what, what, what we were doing. We had uh, an exhibit uh, on the first floor of the GSD uh, called Bang, 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 Housing Policy and the Geography of Fatal and Encounters. Um, and for the past semester, we've really been uh, turning all these uh, efforts into actual uh, research that we'll be sharing uh, Further. And then just in October, um, the ASU organized the Black and Design Conference, uh, which was a great event with a really big uh, turnout. Um, and so it's, it's kind of funny for us because we've also really been thinking very intently on injustice um, and how that really impacts the built environment. Um, and so we have been um, trying to, I guess, interrogate a, a methodology for this. Um, and so often this um, conversation um, starts with kind of a statistic or, or kind of a single data point. Um, we were really interested in bringing the conversation full circle to really think about this um, as a human issue. But again, because we're designers, think about it as a community issue as well. Um, so this is an image from our um, Black, Black Lives Matter installation that we held in Gund. Um, this is an image of our exhibition, Bang, 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 that was um, up um, close to the lobby here. Um, this is an image of Informing Justice. Um, and this was um, two images from Black and Design Conference that just recently took place. Um, and then this is kind of like our bread and butter um, this is the research that we've been focusing on, and this is really what we're going to try to um, corral the troops um, and, and really try to understand and, and break down um, understanding um, equity in the built environment. Um, yeah, so our project was really, uh, like Lindsay said, um, looking at uh, different fatalities and trying to break down um, the notion that these that these people are just uh, data points on a map and, and really try to focus on the communities in, in, in which they live. And like I said uh, earlier, um, Michael Brown was really the, the first case um, that got us going. So this is just, we're going to go through a couple images from our um, current research project, Map the Gap. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the book, we've basically structured it around an atlas that um, we're looking at uh, three, three different cities, Boston, St. Louis, and Baltimore, um, and really trying to build a narrative around each of these uh, people, and then sort of using their stories t to then uh, make some more uh, investigations into the built environment. So we decided to look at uh, housing and urban renewal, uh, ed ed education, um, and then jobs and access to transit. So some of these maps are really just um, looking at St. Louis and looking at where Michael Brown lived, um, what St. Louis as a city um, looks like in terms of its racial distri distribution, um, and then looking at where these fatal encounters are starting to happen, um, looking at the different, uh, de not only de the demographics of St. Louis, but also you know what what is the police force look like, um, looking at median household income, um, trying to just really get a sense of what these communities um, are, are actually like, um, public transportation. So some of these, uh, so some of, uh, some of the findings for, for St. Louis was that looking at the fatal encounters block group, uh, which is the bar uh, all the way to, to, to the left, you can see that in comparison to the rest of the city, the block group in which these encounters are occurring um, have very low uh, median, household, median household incomes, 0% uh, uh, of attainment of a bachelor's degree, and the most reliance on public transportation uh, to get to work. Um, and just hearing about these different en encounters, I think Lindsay and I both, both feel like these are uh, different findings that you don't really think about or that you don't really know, but that really can 
play a, a huge role in some of these uh, outcomes. So then looking at, uh, we actually had the, the Atlas group um, who really looked at uh, nine different cities. Um, and this is just some of the, uh, the urban fabrics uh, of the different cities. And I think the conclusion here was that these fatalities can really happen um, in any type of uh, urban fabric. Um, and then, so we also um, have a chapter on urban renewal specifically. Um, and again, really, this book is about a comparative study. Um, and so we will quickly run through this. I think I'll run past this timeline. Um, but it's, it's really looking at the impacts of housing policy within the built environment. Um, and specifically, we wanted to um, look at the black population. So this image here shows um, the statistics uh, across the top of the um, black population um, with, within Boston, uh, yes, within Boston. Um, and then uh, if you look at the second row of images, second row of maps, it tracks urban renewal designations um, throughout time, so from the 50s to the 80s within Boston. Um, and then the, the last um, series of maps um, overlays those de designations over time with the black population's migration over time within the city. Um, and again, we do the same thing for St. Louis. I don't know if you want to yeah, and I mean, our main takeaways from this, from our chapter, were that uh, urban renewal really played out differently in Boston and St. Louis, and that it was really a tale of two cities. Um, you can see that um, for the uh, for the urban renewal uh, de designations in St. Louis, the black population is has been concentrated there um, in these areas that have been basically designated as a uh, blight. Um, so really, how have these different uh, major, inf these major uh, infrastructure in in investments and different projects been affecting the the black population in, in St. Louis? Um, so you can see that in St. Louis, it's been extremely uh, co co uh, concentrated, whereas in uh, Boston, um, you can see a migration from some of uh, the urban renewal tracks down into uh, other neighborhoods. So it really did play out uh, differently in Boston and St. Louis. And I think Lindsay and I were really just uh, interested in, in unpacking how and why. And so our kind of larger takeaways from um, our work is really being able to ground this work in, in a very kind of rigorous methodology, but also have um, clear takeaways that can be um, instituted for policy action, policy reform, um, and really try to bring it down to the ground um, with very actionable um, recommendations to policymakers. Yeah. yeah. So also, uh, Marcus and I are going to host host a lunch, I guess, um, and we're going to do a brainstorming session. So we're having a hackathon tomorrow on these issues and to further our research. Um, and the brainstorming session is really to get a feel on how we think that hackathons and data are useful to designers. Um, I think there's a lot of mixed feelings about that. And I think that Marcus and I are very, very dedicated to taking hackathons out of a traditional notion of coding and really make it a participatory tool for engagement and learning and teaching and, and, and less about um, kind of this rigorous data set collection tool um, and really make it about communities. So we're going to host lunch today. And if you can stick around tomorrow, um, our hackathon starts at 2.30. Um, so now we're going to get started with the student presentations and discussion portion of the event. Um, so Azura is up first, and if you're presenting, if you could just be ready to kind of jump on the podium after the next person's done so we can make sure to leave time for discussion. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, showing up. I know it's early. Just, okay, let's see, I guess. Okay, here. And I apologize in advance. There is some text on the slides, and I think um, I didn't realize the screen was going to be so small, so I hope it's um, legible. Um, so I'm Azura. I'm, a, I'm in the, my last semester in the landscape architecture program here. 
Um, so I'll start with this poem. Uh, the poet Ross Gay writes of plants as a source of inevitable temporal continuity. Although his word choices dwell on the lyricism of chance, the plants do their work slowly, the poem spins around some and likely and perhaps, Gay is, after all, stating a fact. Plants will grow, and by means of that growth will evoke not only nature's relation to architecture, plants do, like house, but more tangibly, the human sensorium. Plants also provide the ultimate guarantor of human sustenance, oxygen, which was forcefully denied Eric Garner on July 17, 2014, when he became yet another victim of systemic police brutality. The other fa fact at the heart of this poem, that Garner was a horticulturalist, was sourced from an obituary. Gay's poem thus reads as a project of remembrance, an epitaph, but also a reminder that this project may well thrive all around us as continuity in the natural world. As the ultimate spatial verification of that project, the cemetery as landscape type renders palpable the metaphorical cycle between landscape and memory. My research considers questions of remembrance and design in the case of Greenwood Cemetery in Hillsdale, St. Louis. It engages the site's imaginaries, its, its design history, and its present context, both in St. Louis and more broadly. Today I'm going to briefly tell the story of the site, which I am aware is not mine to tell, but which I hope can raise important questions about the uh, sort of the layered narratives that live in landscape and how we might design and engage them as designers. Um, so Greenwood Cemetery, which you can see in the little square in the large area, and then here to the right and the um, more zoomed in, was established in 1874 as the first non-denominational commercial cemetery for Af African Americans in the St. Louis area. Its 32 acres house 6,000 marked graves and up to 50,000 burials, including Harriet Robinson Scott, who was Dred Scott's widow, musician Walter Davis, civil rights leader Charlton Tandy, and many, many others. It's worth noting that Greenwood was founded as part of the rural cemetery movement, which started right here with Mount Auburn. These landscapes celebrated the picturesque as a stage set for commemoration and were based on the principle of one person, one grave. Um, Greenwood's gridded layout, which you can see on the left, is immediately noticeable among its more picturesque features, such as the curvilinear paths, perhaps hinting at a more egalitarian impulse than Mount Auburn and a more deliberate engagement with the surrounding social fabric, which is also a grid. Interestingly, it also seems to reference Père Lachaise Cemetery, which is the one on the right, in Paris, which inspired the notion of the American rural cemetery as a democratic public space. Um, so Greenwood was a vibrant community space through the Jim Crow era, although of course it was segregated. Um, and then upon de jure desegregation, the cemetery saw a sharp decline in use um, due to sort of a shrinking market, if you will, after which divestment and rising poverty engulfed both it and the surrounding community. Today, Greenwood stands derelict and overgrown in one of the poorest, most segregated communities in the metropolitan area. So as you can see here, there's sort of a belt, they're called the, the northern suburbs of St. Louis and Hillsdale is one of them that are highly, highly segregated um, and, and generally poor. Uh, Hillsdale is 96% African American, which is typical of some of these suburbs. And it's estimated median household income of 21,000 is less than half of Missouri's median income. Ferguson, where Michael Brown lived and died and where Black Lives Matter was born, lies a mere five miles away from this site. So thanks to the efforts of dedicated community members, Greenwood is listed both um, on the National Register of Historic Places and as one of Missouri's most endangered historic places today. A nonprofit citizens group, the Greenwood Cemetery Preservation Association, is now advocating for its cle clearing and restoration. The group has begun to map historic graves onto the site, um, and a simple overlay, as you can see here on the right, reveals a haunting palimpsest. Greenwood Cemetery and the possibility of its restoration prompt deep questions about remembrance and the narrative and political agency of landscape. 32 acres of an important place of African American memory have essentially been erased from the map. And this is quite shocking. You can see just that sort of center um, is even just the, you know, the sort of common green as, that on Google Maps designates a, a green area. By means of its ecological dynamism, the landscape is deleting itself. When considering sites which have fallen into disrepair, the narrative of wilderness often frames such ruins as the apex of a natural progression of events. Um, here you see the sort of Detroit's famous feral houses. Um, geographer Dennis Cosgrove calls this the duplicity of landscape. So when we see biomass, we, often, we too often forget design. 
So I'm arguing that the state of Greenwood today is just as much a product of carefully managed systems, in this case racial segregation and discrimination, as well as local and national political decisions, as were Olmstead parks, Olmstead's parks. And in, in, in other words, it is designed, right? And that this, this sort of legacy and this history ought to be read in the future site. And this reality requires us to challenge the very notion of heritage. What are we trying to hold on to in these sites and what are we trying to reverse and why? Taking as a given that landscape is telescopic, my research pushes a critical stance on restoration and on the projective role of the landscape architect. It positions the project of Greenwood as one of active remembrance and change rather than simple restoration. So how can the ecological dynamism of plant life act as an allegory for social dynamism? Um, what does it mean for the two to collide and coalesce? What does it mean to introduce new social life into a space with so much life already rooted into its soil? To what extent can landscape help embody Greenwood's many legacies? And most importantly, what is the role of the designer as both an outsider and an ally? In a recent article in The Nation, a community member in Hillsdale, at a Daniel said of the cemetery, you find a rich history of black St. Louis that we don't even talk about. The issue here is that so much stuff gets covered up. Um, and you can see that very physically there. This history, though, I'm saying, is both covered and spoken by the tangled mass of Greenwood Cemetery, and that it's up to design to sort of make that legible in a way that makes also a vibrant public space. The conditions that have led to you know, Greenwood's disrepair have also increased its value as a site for biodiversity and uh, made it a potential urban oasis. But if the future of Greenwood entails not restoration to an idealized moment in time, but a dynamic place and space, what might it look like? That's, that's hopefully my next step. Um, such a landscape would pay homage to the cemetery's rich history as a burial ground, take advantage of its biodiversity as a community resource, and at the same time also engage directly with the site's recent painful legacies. This would necessitate shifting the emphasis away from clearing, which is sort of the language of renewal, urban renewal as well, and through landscape architecture, strengthening the dialogue between abundant life and the awareness of death. Design should also help leverage the profile of the site as a valuable place of memory in St. Louis and help leverage the sort of power and resources of its community, connecting it to other cultural nodes. In her Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 1989, Toni Morrison asked, what intellectual feats had to be performed for the author or his critic to erase me from a society seething with my presence? Greenwood Cemetery today seethes with the presence and many stories. Through design, those stories can be curated and amplified rather than neutralized. Thank you. Hello, I'm Fi Nguyen, and uh, I'm an MAC1 student here in my final year, and I'm presenting my research project and also my thesis uh, for the city of Saigon, Vietnam. So Saigon has a history that is more complex than any other one in Vietnam. It started out as a collection of craft villages along the river of Saigon, uh, then turned into a feudal seaport, uh, then into like the most developed um, city in Indochina, colonized by the French. And uh, the French, uh, by when they came in, they uh, really uh, started to erase a lot of Saigon's uh, old fabric as well as uh, segregated the people, put the um, local outside the city. So here you can see that they destroyed the Vietnamese cemetery and turned it into a European cemetery. Uh, destroyed a lot of um, architecture, almost like harmonized um, Saigon and built miniature French architecture like the Hotel de Ville or the Cathedral. And then nowadays, uh, the Communist Party is doing the same thing with Saigon by trying to erase um, the um, architectural legacy of the French. And um, again, increasing rent and uh, real estate, uh, trying to build expensive structure. Eventually, the people can no longer afford place that they used to live, so they had to move out of the city. And architecturally, uh, a lot of uh, Saigon's architecture has picked on the different type characteristics of styles from different regimes, uh, from the feudal uh, to the French uh, to American occupation. And now being confused, the communists come not knowing what to do. And they started destroying uh, a lot of uh, the legacy. Again, this is um, the shipyard, one of the most uh, respected sites in Saigon is going to be destroyed in this year. And that's where my thesis side would be. 
And the result of all this uh, gentrification and uh, development that is ignore, ignorant of all the finer fabric of the city, its history, and its locality resulted in the diminishing um, of the original crafts communities, um, very confusing identity in terms of architecture, um, uh, overpopulation, overpollution, a lack of uh, green space, public space. You can see the children just playing on like the street or in construction site. Um, and also a threat to the small vendors or the small businesses, a lot of activities that used to make the city so vibrant. When the government started to ban such activities in the city, the red streets are those that allow for that kind of uh, business and such, and the rest are banned. So my proposal is to look at how design can really help a city remember its, its past, how to bring back the green space and public space to the people, and. Um, claim part of the culture that is being uh, destroyed or threatened to be destroyed. And I look at the shop house typology. This is a type that is uh, oblivious of all the political regime uh, and power and really uh, is adaptive to the lives of the people and the climate. There is a view of the shop house typology that has been changed and now it's kind of losing all of the characteristics that used to make it so uh, relevant to the people. This, um, so I map out all of the shop house type uh, in Saigon and most of the gray spaces. Um, and it's, it's development over time. So these are the characteristics of the shop house typology. First is the corridor and the courtyard that really helps with uh, ventilation and also lighting and create uh, a kind of small semi-public spaces within each house. But on the um, urban scale, you can see that this, uh, these are uh, um, courtyards like create a kind of corridors within the city, creating a public space. Um, and also um, a lot of uh, calibration regarding details within the house. Oops, okay, just go quickly. So my proposal <laughs> um, is basically compacting uh, those villages along the river into this new kind of cultural complex and trying to bring back the um, characteristics of the shop house, but in a larger scale, testing it in the like um, cultural uh, institutional scale, um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Eddie Keller. I'm a uh, second year MDiz History and Philosophy student, and I'm going to be presenting some research as part of the Harvard Mellon Urban Initiative uh, seminar on Berlin. Um, okay, So incessantly and in constantly growing numbers, refugees are streaming into Berlin. So this sentence, as uh, we might uh, wrongly think, is not a recent one. Rather, it's taken from a, a official document of the Senate of Berlin in 1953 regarding the influx of refugees from East Berlin to the West. Um, today, Berlin is dealing with the sort of same uh, situation of a growing influx of Syrian refugees. Um, and with its troubling history, with its uh, past world war, uh, world wars, um, something can be learned from that sort of approach that has been taken in 1953, viewing the refugees not as a problem, but rather as a, a resource encouraging the influx of, of refugees into the city. Um, the aim of this project is to analyze the relationship between both the formal and informal approaches that appear in the city uh, through the specific lens of uh, transportation and mobility. So one of the first documents that we see that kind of exemplifies this approach is a map produced by the city and the Office for Migration and Refugees in which certain stations and uh, locations within the city are uh, proposed for the refugees by simply um, marking them in, Ara in the Arabic language. Um, not a limiting decision, but definitely directing and one that shapes the perception of, of the city for those who use the map. Another approach is a semi-formal map uh, designed by refugees but sponsored by the government and the city in which, again, the information is, is obviously partial but more related to the experience of the refugees themselves. Um, in Berlin, what we see 
uh, lately is a sort of growing um, approach by the citizens themselves to accept refugees and welcome them, um, at times at the cost of tourists. Um, but we can, we can see those things, sorry, especially appearing in various blogs online in which I mined for data to sort of view different demonstration activities, guides for refugees on how to um, incorporate themselves within the city. So this project is basically making a kind of juxtaposition between the two strategies, the formal and the informal. Um, we start by looking at the transportation map, mostly uh, public transport, buses and tram lines and subways, and uh, comparing those with different activities, which at times uh, correspond to what the, the official map offers and at time contradicts. Various things like soup kitchens, libraries, language lessons. Further on, what I did is I mapped um, a sort of uh, time frame of the, the, let's say, the week in the life of a refugee. Of course, partial and limited to a specific time. Um, but again, we can see a kind of correspondence between certain uh, times in the life of, of the local citizens and those of the refugees. The weekends are more heavy on activity, the weekdays less, of course, and Fridays are kind of empty, kind of suggesting the Germans even need uh, some time to rest before the weekend. Um, the last kind of uh, point was to look at one of the main spots for refugees and uh, citizens to, to interact. Um, and examine the, the abundance of public spaces in, in this place, the connections to other places in the city, transportation connections, and the wide array of different activities that happen there every day. And I would like to finish sort of with how I started this project in uh, sort of theory and deep history, um, looking into the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, after Cain, had murdered Abel, um, God has banished him from the earth and sent him to a sort of different kind of movement, um, a movement of refuge. But what Cain did was build a city not, and not uh, sort of uh, submit himself to this God-given nomadicism. And in this way, we can start thinking that maybe cities themselves have always been designed for, refuge, for refugees. And an Israeli and a Jew studying in America um, working on Berlin, I can't think about, cannot help but to think about this history of refuge and as Berlin is a place with various histories to be learned from. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Claudia Tamateo. I'm in the first year of, in the Master of Architecture in Urban Design. Um, today I'm going to present to you um, my, the research that I did during the last fall semester under the framework of reconceptualizing Berlin as a laboratory. Um, so the first approximation to this research, um, I borrowed the idea from Diane Davis uh, in her article, Urban Informality, Remain of the Past or Wave of the future um, as rethinking informality, not, not only as a morally and legally questionable and non-regulated matter, but also as an urban collective uh, cultural asset. So what I'm going to do is um, to analyze some informal interventions in Berlin um, as, as a way to create a diverse and active atmosphere, but also to create bridges between society and governmental institutions. Um, the first objective of, of this research is um, to analyze the, the relationship between governance and citizens' participation and the rights and, and obligations that the citizens have in the city. Um, and to understand the materialization of government, governmentality, um, to have a kind of an alternative way of the mainstream of, of, how, of how the government regulate the city. So the basic questions are, uh, does the power of the state is diminished by the emerging of plural actors active in governance issues? Or do the participatory practices as an integral element of the no modes of governance necessarily lead to citizens' empowerment? Um, I work with two main theoretical uh, concepts about governmentality, which is basically how the government manage uh, the strategies to govern in different contexts, and the right to the city, which is basically um, who, um, which citizens has the right to have rights because they 
uh, signify a, a cultural asset or an economic asset or, or which citizens does not have this right. Um, after the fall of the wall and the reunification of the city in 1989, an intensive program of urban development started in Berlin. Visitors and investors through city marketing events promote the transformation. Since the reunification forces such as economic growth and competitiveness have shaped, shaped, shaped urban policy. In contrast, leftover spaces appeared in consequence, in consequence of the fall of the wall and had been taken by informal settlements since then. The lack of control in the areas between east and west made this phenomenon happen. So this is Lusentab, and I'm going to analyze Princess in the Garden, Holzmark, and Lomil. Uh, Princess in the Garden is a social and ecological urban farm. Nomadic Green, which is a non-profit organization, launched the project as a pilot for the summer of 2009. Um, so this basically uh, is, uh, apart from the idea of urban agriculture, the project has an educational agenda for the city. The objective is to create a space of common learning among heterogeneous citizens. Therefore, they use gardening as a tool to provide education and workshops. It is a tool for social processes. Um, so this is part of the diagrams that you can see later in, in the exhibition. Uh, but basically, I analyze the concept of each part of the social structure, um, the management and the economy, and how we can grade this from commitment to the achievement of the project. Um, so basically, the municipality leases the land to Nomadic Green, uh, which is a nonprofit organization, and they create a community urban farm, uh, which is leased for five years. So the question is, what is going to happen next? And they also have a very close relationship with media, um, Facebook, um, and of course, a very busy cultural agenda. Uh, this is a timeline of the events they do over the, the year. Um, then Holzmark um, was a market based or on temporal activities and flows, and they lately has been kind of formalized. And today is pictured as an over and quarter organized as a cooperative community instead of, of singular interests. Um, so again, this is um, the same kind of analysis. And uh, what I want to highlight about this case is that the project is, is a business where the investors gain profit out of it by creating additional value to city and citizens. Therefore, the social structure is based on lease policies, which is based on the contributions that the applicant can do for the place. There And there are three types of lease, uh, indefinite from five to 10 years, and short-term lease. And finally, Holtzmark. Um, sorry. Uh, finally, Lomil, um, which is a trailer camp that was established right after the fall of the wall, and since then, their efforts are directed to challenge the capitalist consumer society. They promote alternative living spaces based on the principles of collectivism, sustainability, and alternative cultural production. They justify its urban rights by stressing its economic contribution to the city. Um, and then, of course, the uh, VC cultural agenda. So. Um, to finish, I want to highlight that um, the municipality kind of borrowed these this spaces for, for these case studies. Um, to finish, I just want to say that uh, we should embrace hybrid formal and informal interventions because they show diversity and challenge decisions and start important conversations about the city. Hi, my name is Sonia Vangeli. I'm uh, an MLA. Oh. Hi, um, I'm Sonia Vangeli. I'm a graduating MLA student in my last year. Uh, I'll be talking about um, self-built housing, which has been a research interest of mine in the past few years and uh, the topic of a recent paper. Self-built housing is often seen as a marginal practice in the shadow of market and public housing, yet it has been the natural way that people have built shelter for most of human history. In the past few centuries, industrialization, modernism, and neoliberal economics have transformed housing into a standardized, mass-produced commodity, prioritizing exchange value over the actual needs and preferences of the users, and mostly disregarding context. 
Land speculation, rising prices, and competition by foreign investors have made home ownership in the city increasingly unaffordable for low to middle income people and young families. They are forced to choose between renting small apartments in the city or buying tracked housing in distant suburbs, while neither option truly fulfills their needs. Uh, Self-built housing could provide an alternative option that is better suited to people's needs and produces a more diverse and dynamic built environment. Yet currently, it is framed as a desperate option, possible only in the developing cities of the global south, rather than as a real viable choice for everyone. When supported by design and planning, self-built housing has the potential to be an alternative that enables the creativity, skills, and ambitions of people to improve their living conditions and build more successful collective built environments. Sorry, this is not the, the right version of the presentation, but it's OK, I'll just keep going. Um, how could design and planning enable self-built housing to become a viable alternative, creating housing for people rather than for profit? Um, two examples that I'll be talking about from very different contexts, uh, one in Lima, Peru, and one in the Netherlands, in Almere, show how a balance of bottom-up and top-down strategies can produce successful, diverse, and adaptable self-built communities. So Via El Salvador, which you see the beginnings of here, is an urban district at the south edge of Lima, Peru, that began as an informal settlement of new ur urban migrants in the 1970s, but has evolved into a thriving mixed-use urban district of, um, of the city. It began as a typical informal settlement, starting with the illegal invasion of undervalued land, initial construction of shacks made of simple materials to claim the plot, and over time incrementally building and expanding two to three story houses made of concrete and brick. The infrastructure, schools, and public services were also self-built and continue to be managed by the community, which has been internationally recognized for its self-organization. The process was assisted early on by architect Miguel Romero, who designed the modular block morphology of uh, housing parcels organized around a common open space, which also corresponds to a unit of community organization. He also planned the overall land use zoning, roads, and open space framework, including a large district park, wide greenways, uh, uh, greenway avenues, and courtyards within each block that provide the urban structure of the district. The design framework made a huge difference in allowing what began as a poor, informal settlement to evolve over time into a successful urban district that has become incorporated into the fabric of the, the formal city and continues to grow and improve um, its quality of the built environment. In a completely different context in the Netherlands, um, where there has been a long tradition of mass housing built by the state, there has been a renewal of self-built housing as an expression of freedom of choice and individuality. Self-built housing has become a popular strategy in new development areas such as Homeris Quartier and Europa Quartier in the new city of Almere. The process is guided by planning strategy um, to design the basic framework, subdivide the land to be sold as free build plots, and design built form rules to guide the process so that individual freedom is maximized without undermining collective goals. Driven by the creativity and ambitions of the many individual um, owner builders and guided by the framework and parameters, the area is gradually building up into a diverse community that continues to grow and change. Another expansion area of Almere called Osterwald uh, is guided by a more radical strategy called Freeland, which extends the ambitions of self-build from housing to infrastructure, services, and open space to the whole community. The strategy provides an overall area framework and regulates a set mix of land use proportions for every plot of land, encouraging diversity of uses while preserving the agricultural character of the site. Different sized plots can be bought individually or collectively by people interested in sharing the land to develop different uses and collaborating to build the roads, off-grid infrastructure and services to fit their needs. The strategy now formalized uh, in planning policy is intended to encourage the emergence of new forms of utopian, self-sufficient, self-organized urbanism that minimizes top-down regulation and maximizes individual freedoms and creativity. Since it's still relatively new, it remains to be seen what forms of urbanism it will actually produce. 
As shown by these very different approaches from different contexts, self-built housing has a lot of potential and flexibility to provide new creative alternatives to dominant models of development, not only in developing contexts, but also in our North American cities. By providing ambitious young people with opportunities to build their own customized housing, they are transformed from passive consumers of the housing market into active citizens participating in their communities, creating value, and fulfilling their human potential. By engaging more people in the production of the built environment and providing the necessary support and tools through design and planning, self-built housing could lead toward new forms of more diverse, inclusive, just, and adaptable city building. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, so we're really glad to be here today. We're going to take a slightly different approach because we're presenting on behalf of our class and some of the themes that we've explored today uh, throughout the course so far through the semester. Um, and we wanted to do that because the conference is called Designing Justice, and our class is designed for the just city. So really good parallel. Thank you. <laughs> um, but sincerely, we really want to thank the organizers for bringing such a dynamic group of people together to talk about what we have felt and we know to be the most important issue facing our society today. The presence or absence of justice is felt on all fronts, from the economy to the built environment, and it's really uplifting to witness designers work in interdisciplinary fashions in the pursuit of that justice. So thank you to everyone that's participating. Um, after a brief introduction of the course and its affiliation with the Just City Project, we'll walk you through some of the themes our classmates have been tackling throughout the semester. I'm Shani Carter. I am a graduating student in the Urban Planning Program. And I'm Amanda Miller, a first year master in design studies student in urbanism, landscape, and ecology. Um, so we are both contributors to the Just City Project, which is a research initiative started at the J. Max Bond Center um, on design for the Just City, um, formerly affiliated with the City College of New York. The project is designed to investigate the role of design in facilitating greater urban justice in our cities and neighborhoods. It's now ho housed here at the Graduate School of Design and the initiative will continue to investigate the definition of the just city, create tools for measuring design's impact on justice and injustice, and develop a value-based practice model for improved participatory planning methods. Tony L. Griffin, professor in practice in urban planning here at the Graduate School of Design, created the initiative and teaches the Design for the Just City seminar. So as part of this larger project, the course aims to investigate the roots and current conditions of injustice in cities, as well as concepts of urban justice and the possibilities of design movements to affect justice. To, this, to that end, we are developing metrics to assess how design can facilitate greater urban justice and use data collection tools to assess the presence of justice and or injustice in local neighborhoods. So we'll start by kind of just taking you through the timeline of the course so far. And the class has really helped us evaluate a new framework for thinking about justice. For instance, we started off by asking ourselves, what does a just city look like? And pretty much the class, everyone approached it from a really social perspective, but at different scales. Um, so where do we start? Omar Carrillo um, did a really great mural in terms of thinking about human dignity and what does that look like within the space of a city. Um, this is set in the, the in the setting of a park. And then Jimena Velos really looked more at the systems approach, like what is needed in terms of basic infrastructure and providing that for housing and for the other societal aspects that present justice. Whitney Hansley took a really complex approach and started to really think about how the hope and how reality interplay with each other. And um, we thought that this was amazing and looking at it from more of an individual and personal perspective. And Kara Michelle really took it to looking at the lens of life and her brother as a young black man. How does he walk through life and how does that impact justice within our society? Um, we then did a typical millennials activity, um, which was to use Insta Instagram. Um, you can see some of that effort on the back wall here. Um, and I'm not actually really much of an Instagrammer, but uh, it was great to see the possibilities of using a social media platform um, towards the important mission of justice in the city. 
Um, and I think as a collective whole, we realize that uh, from this exercise that justice isn't always so clear cut and, and simple. So a few quick examples. Uh, this first is an image of the McGrath Highway um, that, that is on the western side of the East Somerville neighborhood. And so we all know that highways can be connective, but clearly in this example it's also um, very divisive. It disrupts an existing street grid and is reducing access. Um, Looking then at an interior, this is a local Brazilian grocery store in the same neighborhood. Um, it's in the main commercial area and also a very diverse district. So allowing opportunities for these types of local businesses is a great story of justice through food access. Um, these are some examples of parks. Um, they look like great amenities, but then some of the questions that we have are um, what types of parks did they leave behind whenever they built in, in a new space? Um, how are they maintained and who uses them? And finally, Assembly Square. Um, this is a new development on the former Ford manufacturing plant. And um, it provides much needed retail and potentially job opportunities. But many question um, its true social value, who it's for, um, and who, what communities it's serving. So a lot of our research involves critique of the built environment, but the process goes beyond design itself to also understand the human experience within these environments, how they shape them and how they are shaped by them as well. Um, so we've all built off of our personal manifestos and collages from the beginning of the semester to further our opinions about the just city and layer on specific attitudes about the role of design on the city at different scales, whether geographic, structural, political, or social. On the screen is an, an example of one of the written manifestos, and there are also video ones that will um, be playing throughout the exhibit later. So we all, some of the most compelling issues that were presented were access, freedom of choice, safety, security, neighborhood change. And we all expressed these ideas through video and writing. Um, but so we mentioned our Instagram exhibit over there. And we want you guys to participate in that later, but also please view the videos. And if we can just go to the next slide, we are really promoting heavily the class's Instagram account, Just City or Not. Um, but then also please join the conversation on Just City or Not with the hashtag, um, because you're contributing to our understanding, but also to the broader public's understanding of what a Just City looks like to you. And I think that that's really the best tool that we can use at this moment. And I guess we just want to thank all of the guest, wonderful guest speakers and Tony for coming in. You can see some of their concepts here. Um, there's too numerous to name right now, but um, we very much appreciate um, your assistance in helping us develop our own personal frameworks and how we see justice. So moving forward, we're going to leave you with two questions. How can we map and record justice? And how can we measure and diagnose design's impact on justice? Thank you. So now it's time to have a brief discussion. So I'm going to ask um, all the presenters and one representative from the Just City class um, to come up and sit on the panel, and also um, the moderators, student moderators, who will be introducing um, the guests for the discussion. Okay, there we go. Um, good morning. Thank you for being here. And to all the students who have presented, thank you so much. Um, my name is Courtney Sharp, and I'm a graduating student in urban planning. Miriam Keller. I'm a first year student in urban planning and public policy here. And to uh, kick off our conversation, we're going to begin by introducing our guest commentators, David Harvey and Killian Riano. So, Please excuse me when I read the bio from the phone. Uh, so I'm introducing uh, David Harvey. 
And uh, to begin with the words that have been shared with us throughout the week from the school, um, it is his contention that the production of space, especially distribution and organization of the territory, um, constitutes principal aspect of capitalist economies. His writings on the theme have contributed to the ongoing political debate on globalization and on the different spatial strategies associated to global processes. A foundation of Harvey's intellectual project is his close reading and interpretation of Karl Marx's Capital, which he has taught and read for decades and documented in his companion to Marx's Capital. Um, but Harvey's work is distinguished by the way he has brought Marxism together with geography uh, with productive results for each discipline. Um, among other ideas, Harvey is known for his critical interpretation of the ideas of Henri Lefebvre and on his formulation on the right to the city. His book, Spaces of Hope, explores a role for architecture in bridging between uh, human body and uneven development that is characteristic of globalization. I know many of us have read your works and classes here and before, so we're amazed to have you with us today. And Killian, thank you also for joining. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing you. So, uh, Killian is a, an architectural and urban designer, researcher, writer, and educator working out of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he is the founder and principal of DSGN AGNC, a collaborative design research uh, studio exploring political engagement through architecture, urbanism, and art. Um, in practice in academia, Killian's works with stakeholders and transdisciplinary teams to create uh, comprehensive research that can be used to propose a variety of spatial designs and target of policies and actions. I'm very action oriented, I could tell by looking at your work. Uh, Killian is also a uh, um, has had experience teaching here and um, across the nation in design and architectural schools and studios. So um, we're glad to have you here with our students today. <laughs> so um, I think our goal of the format here is to just kind of start a, a conversation about how all of the great work that we heard about this morning starts to engage broader issues of justice, how we think about justice, and what is the role of designers in um, advancing that, both uh, here while in school, but also, of course, in practice? And I have um, sort of one, one question to start us off, um, just based on sort of being a little bit familiar with your work as we were sort of curating and learning about it, um, and also listening today. So in um, Lindsay and Marcus's presentation, one of the definitions of justice they had I wrote down, because I liked it, conformity to truth, fact, or reason. And a lot of students' work today touched on or how we actually address and look at history and the tensions in um, design, which is a practice that um, is about change in some way. And so how do we balance um, and think about critically preservation and history as designers? Yeah, so this conversation is open for yeah, but, but students to reflect on that and yeah, definitely um, want um, our sort of discussants, our respondents here today to sort of, you've spent so much time thinking about these questions and sort of what did you hear today that in the student work that prompted sort of reflection on what you've written or practiced throughout your career? I guess I'll take a crack at it. Is this okay? Sounds a little robotic. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm not 100% sure how to like answer that. It's a big question, right? It's uh, talking about how do you deal both with the history that's going to, especially in the in American context, that is going to have a lot of complexities in the current condition, and then begin to push that forward. Um, I, I, I have to say that, for example, for me, what, what became interesting is to see a couple of approaches that seem to be developing that, that could begin to help out with that. I was especially taken with the, the Just City presentations of the, the collages that they made uh, about what Just City meant, because it seemed to be collapsing many things. Uh, so so uh, often, for example, when, I, when looking at this information, what I, one of the things that I'm very conscious of is that either we're looking at a snapshot in time or that if we, uh, like, 
when, whenever we get to this point of justice, and, and I think this is the, one of the questions that's coming around here, is justice for whom, right? We have to begin to describe that. Then we have to begin to describe what community means. And depending on how, how we describe that, we're, we, we, we might be putting up some walls, uh, right? And then how do, how do, how do those things uh, allow for change over time? But a change that makes sense, right? Because the, the, the other, right? Uh, new immigrant groups are going to come. Things are going to change uh, on the ground. How would the spaces there begin to be able to co uh, accommodate that? So our notion of, of, of justice and, 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 uh, uh, and neighborhood and community changes that way. And, for me, and, and I, I've been studying for a while uh, a place in New York City, Jackson Heights, and North Corona in Queens, what people call the most diverse place in the world, you know, 160 something languages spoken. One corner is little India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Philippines, Colombia, Ecuador, Korea, China. So, in, the, in those moments, it's about trying to understand how people with multiple kind of uh, p bodies, people that have different needs, different subjectivities, can begin to aggregate to create larger political uh, ideals without giving up their identity, per se. So beginning to explore what uh, uh, that, that, that new identity, that new community, one that is flexible, that it, this, its walls are permeable, however, that is understood that there are certain communities that need more agency, right? Like, that need more actual, uh, that, that, that they don't have control. My, my, my thing is to say that changing communities is also sometimes a, her uh, a red herring, that, uh, you know, bed and the Upper East Side, they change in very dramatic ways, and it's because of the power that each of those, the, the, com the people that live in those communities have, and the control they have over the change uh, in their communities. So for me, it's a little bit of that, is to understand agency, power, and the meaning that, and then also beginning to, to project, how, how is this going to change? How do people on the ground? And then it becomes a set of negotiations. So, like how, so we go into designing, the, perhaps not the things, but the moments in which people can negotiate with each other. I don't know if I... um, yeah, it's, it's actually rather difficult to respond to what, what, what you guys have done. And, um, in, in a sense, but there are some things I didn't hear that I would have liked to find out more about. Uh, one thing is, well, what, what particular way of understanding justice frames what you're doing? Uh, what I would do if I was you, I would read Iris Marion Young on justice and the politics of difference and say, okay, this basically sets up dimensionalities of how to think about justice and I'm going to try and follow through on, on some of the ideas like that because otherwise we all know that justice is a very, you know, as uh, Plato once uh, said in his dialogues, uh, you know, he had Thrasymachus say justice is whatever the ruling class says it is. And, and uh, <clears throat> on that basis I would then ask another question. <clears throat> Is justice something that is uh, close to uh, the individual? Most of the presentations, it seemed to me, had a conception of the individual at the base of what you were doing. The authenticity of the individual. Uh, I didn't hear too much about the building of solidarities, the development of collective uh, action. I didn't hear very much on the role of uh, the design process of actually bringing people into uh, a collective vision of what their city should, should, should be like. Now, maybe some of you are doing that, but this is the kind of question I would, I think, uh, wanna, want, want to pose. Um, <clears throat> thirdly, there's this uh, question of history, which is uh, very complex. And I, again, I... Um, <clears throat> It might be useful for you to re reflect a little bit on, 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 on the role of this. Uh, I tend to be a bit of a fan of uh, Walter Benjamin on, on this, and you might be interesting to read it. I mean, he, he distinguishes between history and memory. And for him, history is something that gets formalized and actually uh, freezes things in a certain narrative. 
Memory is something, as he says, erupts at certain moments of danger and is uncontrollable. And what you see frequently in mass movements is a sudden eruption of memory. And, and, and I think that the distinction between the two is, uh, of history and memory is, is maybe worthwhile uh, thinking about in whatever it is you're doing. And in doing that, I'm always of a mind, you know, I mean, Sorry, I can never talk for very long without citing Marx, you know. It's sort of <laughs> one of my habits. But, but in the 18th Brumaire, he talks about the way in which history weighs on the, the brain of the living, like, weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. And, but, the, uh, but he doesn't go on from that to say, therefore, the history should be junk. But he does talk about, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be trying to dress up what it is we're doing today in the poetry of the past. We should be creating the poetry of our own future. And that's the question is, do, what does that poetry of the, of the future, how does it approach the question uh, of, uh, of the historical, uh, historical record? And uh, my, my own sort of answer to that in something like uh, uh, Spaces of Hope was I uh, used the uh, phrase from uh, Balzac who said that hope is memory that desires. And I think that, for instance, if you're thinking about the cemetery and how to use that, you're thinking about how to resurrect things, uh, there's a big distinction between the power of collective memory as a political force and nostalgia as a restraining force. And so it's, it's problematic. And I think both the conception of justice and the conception of history, memory, and so on, is problematic, and, and, and I, I would sort of want to ask some questions about, well, how are you thinking through uh, that problematic and how are you approaching it? Because uh, I think many of the things you're trying to do are uh, kind of resurrecting, uh, you know, the, the, the history, and, and you see it as a, as a positive uh, force, but it's not always that way. It can, in fact, be uh, a negative force. The uh, one final point I would make is that, you know, I sympathize very much with the whole history of trying to sort of reshape the city by doing these kinds of things. And, um, and, I, and I tried many years uh, in Baltimore to participate in many things like this. And you can see the last year how successful I was in, in transforming uh, that city because it went up in a riot just as it had about the time I arrived there. Um, but one of the things, I, one, of the, one of the ideas that kept on washing over me as, as I got more and more, um, I don't want to call it cynical, uh, conclusions uh, of the experience was that, uh, you know, a lot of policies you find are, are extremely successful where they're least needed, and they're least successful where they're most needed. And, and, and this means that you're always confronted, uh, and you're dealing with those places that most need it, and, you're, and, and therefore you're also dealing with a situation which is almost not destined to failure, but is going to be hardest of all to make something stick. And, and so, again, I think that uh, um, a recognition uh, that, that certain policies over, uh, say, affordable housing or whatever it is can, can, can work in certain kinds of ways in certain kinds of places, uh, but not, not in others, that that, that, that in itself, uh, there's an inequality built into uh, the way in which uh, political interventions, state interventions, or even communal action uh, can, can really work. So from the very base, uh, you really have to go to the roots of uh, that inequality, deal with why is it that the state can solve that kind of problem but not that one? Why is it that communal action can actually rise and do, do this in this part of the city but it fails somewhere else? So this is kind of one of the, the context, I think, in which uh, many of you are working, because the root of the injustice, it seems to me, is that 
uh, is, 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 is that. But, uh, the, you know, these are just ideas uh, you might want to bear in mind as, as, you go, as, uh, as you go forward to sort of think a bit further, a bit further about. I thought this was happening. Give it a second. Okay, is it working? Yeah. Is it? Here. I, okay, I don't, I can't. Yeah. Hello? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, whatever. Sorry. Anyways, <laughs> thank you um, for your comments. And I, I think the tension between history and memory is something that I've been thinking a lot, especially in the context of landscape, because I think the very material, what sort of, what, you know, what differentiates landscape maybe than, than other modes of building an environment is that the very material is always changing. So there's no real way of freezing. I mean, you can go back, you can clear and start over, um, which I think is one sort of view on restoration that is perhaps more about nostalgia and kind of coming back to the past. But I think with landscape, you also have the chance to be more selective and kind of um, feed into this process of constant change, which I think, you know, in the case of Greenwood, um, given its, its, its um, dramatic change over time, I think is worth considering as an approach. Um, and I think on the question of justice, um, when I was thinking about this place, I was really, I mean, it's, it's what strikes me is that this, this, sort, this very important space of memory and sort of, you know, um, of collective memory for that, for that particular community has essentially been engulfed. And I think that that in itself is an injustice, an injustice. That narrative, because of various sort of structural, I think, uh, rooting from structural processes has sort of been erased. And so maybe um, one way of looking at justice is the chance for um, creating space for many, many narratives to come through. And that's, that kind of works individually and collectively, right? Because within a collective narrative, there are by nature many, many, many individual narratives. But I think the importance of not sort of privileging one or the, over the other, and then also obviously of like privileging one, one strand um, over many others, which is the case in many places. And then bursts of memory, I think also, you know, I would say that we're in the Benjamin conception, like we're in the middle of one of these sort of bursts of memories, I think, in terms of race in America. Um, and I think, yeah, that is also another context. So on that note, I've been thinking a lot about history and memory as well. And um, so like just in the case of Vietnam, the history has been re rewritten and written the whole time, each time a new regime comes up. So like as Benjamin said, that kind of history covers up marks of suffering or to like torture or incompleteness of this war. So there's a whole, basically 99% of the people in Vietnam, their history or their memory is never written. And um, I was looking at the shop house in a way because by virtue of it adapting to the lives of the people, I believe that it holds in it the memories of their lives throughout the year, just the way it's organized, how they move within the space. And that's where memory lies for me. Yeah, um, I think in a way this is sort of revolving around the question of, of definitions and, and the negotiations, the way you kind of mentioned it in the beginning. And I want to mention two, I mean, two different professors that kind of mentioned histories in, in their own words. One uh, said uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it definitely rhymes. And the other said um, history is not only what we write about, it's also what we write. And I think we kind of have to keep that in mind that there is a question of negotiation and concession in what we define as history, as just as justice, as the narrative that we choose, and and a negotiation between the individual and the community and how do we how do we let go of certain narratives or how do we accept uh, subsequently an, an opposing narrative perhaps? or letting go of the notion of opposition of narratives, um, and how we always recognize that every document that we produce, whether written or graphic or a built document, becomes a historical document in its own right, becomes a sort of expression of a specific history, which is something that I think is a bit of a danger when we deal with these kind of grand ideas, when we say justice as a, 
as a slogan and we don't delve into what that actually means, we're always in the danger of privileging one type of justice over another. And it always comes back to, to I think, um, a notion of trying to encapsulate all possible justices or all possible narratives or all possible histories, which I'm not sure is even possible. Um, I was thinking about um, how this justice can be understood as uh, close to individual and auth authenticity. Um, so in the case, for example, in Berlin, um, these communities are trying to make statements and critique society. But the question is, uh, like, how far away can, can you go for the mainstream of the government um, so, uh, sort of to address this um, diversity and, and maybe under the framework of, of spaces of hope, um, which will be the potential of this um, informal or maybe refugee um, uh, spaces to build justice. Um, because, for example, in Berlin, a lot of informal settlements have their own statements, but a lot of others, they are very like into this motto of Berlin as a creative city. So at the end, maybe sometimes it's uh, kind of marketing for the city, like building this trendy um, image and not, not only and, and not what is supposed to be like to make statements and critique the society and trying to build this alternative way. Can I just add one thing, which is I think something that keeps coming up and now I, I love the kind of beginning to understand from individual to to collect it, right? And often beginning with the individual has even a strong history within feminist and post-colonial theory. It's very important to see the body as a side of politic. But the problem is when that, that stays that way and then it doesn't begin to rise up to the collective, doesn't begin, doesn't, doesn't rise up to the systematic. And maybe that's where history, where some of the things that we, we're calling history makes sense. It gives us context to the current uh, system that individuals play within and in that it could be quite helpful. Uh, and, uh, and, and one thing that I think that uh, in a little bit of uh, something that I saw in the project, something that you see in many urban design programs right now is this question of how much do you begin to opt out of the system, right? So the, 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 the informal, all these, all these uh, questions, which the informal also always has form. It's just a different kind of form. Uh, then, then, the, then the one that we that is clearer, and and then the question then becomes: How much do we detach from that existing form, and how much do we double down on it? Uh, and it also seems like that has an also a history that here in the U.S. It, it, it matters to talk about then people of color and people that are outside of the structure of power often kind of still relate to power. People within power want to create their own thing because even outside of it, they will have a little bit of power. So these, these are some interesting questions because at the end of the day, we're questioning how do we collectivize? What does that mean? At what scale? And then at what point do you begin to care about that other again? Like we can create a little commune here do we care about the commune uh, down the street at uh, Northeastern or whatever? And, and at what point does it matter? Can I say something here? I just want to make a bridge between this conversation and yesterday, if it's possible. Just because that's one of the reasons that we're, um, I mean, this, the presentations are amazing. And I, I loved when you asked Miriam the question about history. If I can say, it's not an abstract question. And in fact, the whole point of yesterday, the conference, and here we've got Colin, who was like presenting in the morning. The whole point of the conference yesterday was to actually answer that question in the context of a real place and real struggles and real structural conditions. So I mean, somebody asked me yesterday after the conference, I have a general question. We are constantly in planning design, I have these general questions. But I do want us to think about in addition to the insights in all your comments, the importance of framing, linking those questions to real world time and place. Um, and I, so I want to kind of one up Davey about, David Harvey about Marx and remind us in the 18th Brumaire, David, um, David, Karl Marx says, men make their own history, but not in conditions of their choosing. And it seems to me what we were trying to do yesterday in the conference was start that conversation how understanding the history of spatial uh, segregation, exclusion, empire, civil war, 
the civil, you know, civil rights movement, et cetera, in a place like St. Louis then laid the conditions for struggles, for appropriations of memory, for different definitions, laying out possibilities and constraints on what's possible in the present. So I, I just wanted to remind us that one of the reasons we're here is to kind of go back and forth between individual projects, thinking about insights, but also learning deeply from certain places that give you insight into answering those uh, questions about uh, how history enables or constrains you. Thank you so much for providing that link between the two. Okay. Thank you so much for providing the link between uh, the conference and today. Um, building upon some of the things that we've heard from the panelists and through the presentations themselves, I have a question for all of you about um, the subtext here of responsibility. So it seems that people have a very strong inclination to do this work um, because there's a personal sense of responsibility. So my question is how much agency do designers really have? What is our power? And to that point as well, I, can we talk a bit about designing with versus designing for? Yeah, I mean, I think that's at the center of my of my so, and and I think it also goes to Diane's comment, which is maybe about that's where the importance of site comes in versus sort of you know broad the article ideas, which are super important to ground any intervention. But then I think you know site specificity is where you're going to get into the very very you know specific um, mechanisms of change and power and the dynamics that have formed a certain built space over time. Um, and so I, what I'm super interested in, in my, the site that I kind of stumbled across last spring when I, when I was looking, I was in a class on cultural landscapes. Um, and I, I mean, I think it's such, since then I have not been able to go yet, which already just makes me feel like, what am I even doing? So I've been, <laughs> I've been looking at history, the history of the site as far as I can tell from records and um, from reading about it, but I think, the agency of a designer maybe only starts, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is up for, it's a question, like, does it only start when you actually finally set foot on a site? Like, can you even be a designer before you know a place physically and sort of intimately? Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the, you know, obviously what I was saying, it's like not my story to tell, but I think it raises important questions for everyone to consider. And so that's where I think the role of like people who actually care for the site and have memories and have a history in it that are, you know, they're very personal. Like how do you, what is the interaction between someone who is interested and, and feels a sense of responsibility but doesn't have any of the sort of, I don't know, the connection to it. Um, so that's, that's the question of designing with. Like are, as a designer and ally, like do you just start as an ally? And it's, I think you start by learning from, you know, by listening and learning. Um, and maybe that takes a really, really, really long time <laughs> before you actually become very projective. I know we're running out of time, um, but just to build off of that, I think that that's something that especially is relevant for the Design for the Just City course in terms of designers looking at a place, trying to understand how to, um, how to create that narrative or provide that story and then even to validate what some people might be feeling within their own spaces. And, and I can uh, make this a little bit like a legal battle, right? Or the battle you know, for feminism or against sexual discrimination or anything like that. It's You have professionals that are looking at this from a standpoint of what does it look like on the ground? How can we really create this narrative? But then you're also working with the community to build that power and build that capacity and get them to understand and to feel like, oh, like, this is validating what I've been doing and this is validating what I've been feeling all along, but also getting them to see that they're not alone and that there are other people that are feeling the same way and taking that information and then using that to then you know, reframe the narrative and reframe the story of what they're trying to do. And I think that, especially dealing with American culture, that's something that is really just so powerful because you can change formal institutions just by changing the narrative. And I think that that's what designers have a really powerful way of doing, whether it's through visualization or just through the simple collection of data itself. Can, he, can I just add a little bit on this? Because I think this is, uh, this is the question, right? Is that, honestly, even the question for my entire practice, for the way I teach, is exactly this, right? And I'm going to share with you uh, an experience. And the experience was taking uh, 12, 
something, 13 students, to Medellin, Colombia. I taught a studio looking at, at Comuna Dos of Medellin, Colombia, uh, at Parsons, uh, and I co-taught it with an anthropologist. Uh, the students had to stay in the Comuna where we were working, and actually was in partnership with one of the Love Fellows, Alejandro Echeverri. Uh, and as he was beginning to form Urbam, and we, it was actually a great experience. But we were working there with a group. That group had been working on the ground for 30 years doing theater of the oppressed processes. And uh, theater of the oppressed then became a really interesting cubic to begin to think about some of these questions for me even today in which they go and, and, and give people that have training, have expertise, they, they don't negate that from themselves, and it's all about the community, whatever they want, because that's also a little bit of a falsehood at times, and it can, you know, again, communities can do pretty crappy things, right? The, the, sometimes you gotta be, have a critical point of view. You have to have, you, facilitation matters. That's something that I really enjoyed out of their process. Beyond that, it was a group that you know, was able to negotiate <laughs> peace processes between drug lords that, 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 were, that had really taken over that neighborhood throughout Medellin's history, and now was beginning to get into urban design. But when they got into urban design in a funny way, they were beginning to do it in the, way that, in the, in the most kind of traditional way possible. So we were there trying to like, learn and try to use the same processes by which theater of the press allows people to replay potential futures in the way that we're talking about here, that come out of grounded and, and, and discuss presence, uh, and, and it, it became a very helpful thing to see, to, to begin to think of the designer as a facilitator. And that facilitation might matter, and it might change in different, in different purposes. I, everyone's, you know, often you set up the conditions, and you allow then things to happen, and then you, from that you, you go back, you kind of continue work, you go back, and, and, and it's a back and forth. Uh, and, and the final thing I'll say about this, this is, this is a, because this is an important question and issues of authorship, even the way we practice in the US, all this be, becomes part of it. It's very complicated to do these kind of things. Some of the things that it, in other countries, in Latin America, in Europe, and, uh, you're beginning to see practices that are beginning to work in completely different ways, that are not the master planner, that are not the master architect, but are really embedded. Artists are asking this question. That, uh, so I would suggest that you guys take a look at uh, some of the, the artists and the way they're beginning to solve. So, uh, so look at Chantal Mouffe's writing, uh, Claire Bishops, uh, a whole bunch of people that are beginning to theorize these exact same questions from the art perspective. Uh, and the, finally, the last thing I'll say is that I think that the, 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 the job of the designer is then done, not done when the design, that the design could, should continue to give that agency for it, that it is never seen as a complete thing, but rather the beginning the beginning uh, maybe statement through a very kind of comprehensive and rigorous process that includes these kind of uh, conversations, but then that, that statement gets rethought and that, that you literally begin to play with that history and you don't even know exactly what, what's gonna happen to the thing you did uh, 10 years from now, 15 years, maybe you even make it part of the design that this is meant to change within five years and a new set of negotiations happens, et cetera. Yeah, this is a great conversation, and unfortunately, in the interest of time, we're going to have to cut it short, <laughs> but it's not always the way. Um, and I think also a really great chance, like Diane was saying, to dig in more on the issues that were unearthed in the last few days of the conference through the lens of student work, um, both in St. Louis, but really around the world, too. So thank you so much for everybody, and we're um, just next going to hear a little bit more about work in the city of Boston, um, of course, our, our home region, to... Um, address some of these issues here. Um, I just thank you for what Diane said. Um, Ken Reardon yesterday talked about East St. Louis and the successes they had going to East St. Louis. Um, oh, I, I was thinking about Ken Reardon's discussion yesterday on East St. Louis, which was a desperately, in desperate situations. Um, much of it, the change there came out of the civil rights movement um, and even deeper memory. But what he talks about, about academics going in when the first thing he's greeted with is the last thing we need is more academics telling us what to do. And what they wind up with is having a school for planning for the people who live there to help plan their own community. So, you know, drawing on that, I think that's one of the things you're talking about. And, and I think it really links back to what was yesterday. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Again, I hate cutting this off, but um, we do have an excellent keynote 
speaker coming up. Um, so if everyone, uh, while I get her set up, if we could have the designing justice helpers try to bring more chairs out into kind of the center of the room so everyone can have a seat. Um, thanks. There's like a pocket of space back there between those tables. guys. Thank you. Okay, I think we probably have enough chairs, so if everyone can just start finding their seat in the interest of time. Okay, everyone, we're going to get started with our keynote. Um, so if everyone could please find a seat, and there'll be a lot more time to mix and mingle after the student presentations at lunch over pizza. All right, thanks so much. Um, so we are really excited to welcome Dr. Atia Martin here today. Um, and I'll just give a brief introduction um, before she gets started. So Dr. Atia Martin is a certified emergency manager with experience in public health, emergency management, intelligence, and homeland security. Mayor Martin Walsh appointed her as the chief resiliency officer for the city of Boston as part of the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient City Initiative, where she is responsible for leading the development and implementation of Boston's resilience strategy. Boston will focus on advancing racial equity as the foundation of the resilience strategy process to increase our shared ability to thrive after emergencies. Dr. Martin is also adjunct faculty at the Master of Homeland Security at Northeastern University. She was previously the director of the Office of Public Health Pre Preparedness at the Boston Public Health Commission. Her professional experience includes the Boston Police Department's Regional Intelligence Center, City of Boston Mayor's Office of Emergency Management, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, and active duty Air Force assigned to the National Security Agency. Um, Dr. Martin is doing really exciting work here in Boston, and we are so thankful that she decided to join us um, for our Designing Justice event. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to bring this down for a short person. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Yes? Are we ready? Yes? So. I'm a pacer, so I'm going to try to contain my energy to behind this podium. So bear with me as I try to do that. So what I'm going to do today um, is talk a bit about equity so that we're all on the same page of when I say it, what I mean. Um, we'll talk a bit about resilience. 
both in the context of 100 Resilient Cities and how they talk about resilience, as well as how I talk about resilience, which is very much related, a little bit different. Um, what is responsible resilience, um, which is not a thing except for what I made up for the purposes of this process, but will become a thing because it's something that's sorely needed. Um, the connection between race and trauma and how that plays into resilience, how that plays into um, how we need to look at policies and practices and the way that we approach doing business as government, as institutions, engaging with communities, um, as well as community organizations also engaging with communities. Is that not loud enough? Was I not loud enough for folks? For the recording. Oh, okay. Just making sure. Um, and then lastly, lastly, I'll talk about Boston's approach um, to the 100 Resilient Cities process and what we've learned up to this point, what it means for our uh, priorities, as well as what's coming up in the future. So when 100 Resilient Cities talks about resilience, they're usually talking about the ability of individuals, communities, organizations to adapt or to survive, adapt, and grow after emergencies. And they usually talk about it in two ways. One is the chronic stresses in communities that are tearing at the fabric of communities. And we've seen this. You all have been talking about these types of things, I believe, over the last two days, which are things like racism, things like disinvestment, things like high unemployment rates. So this whole range of uh, issues that our communities are dealing with, um, poor investment in infrastructure and built environment. Um, so all of these things that culminate in order to tear at the ability of communities to be able to meet basic needs, move beyond survival and into being able to thrive. On the other side of that, we have the traditional emergencies and disasters, right? The things that are more like the tornadoes and hurricanes, terrorism, all of those things. And what's interesting is about resilience in this framework is that it doesn't make a distinction between what happens after emergencies and what happens before. And I think that's really important because it's a different direction than we've taken within this field over the last several years. Um, so I use this quote a lot because it just reminds us of uh, the fact that when we talk about resilience, um, oftentimes it's really about prioritizing and doing the hard work, right? And that's part of understanding our resilience is our ability to dig into the difficult issues, roll up our sleeves, and be able to work through them. There's a great quote um, that someone shared with me that allegedly uh, came from Eric Holder's grandfather, um, which is this idea that it's impossible to wring your hands and roll up your sleeves at the same time, so you might as well just roll up your sleeves and get to work. And so I found uh, a whole lot of value in that, and you'll see a, a big theme around getting to work in terms of how I talk about um, uh, this approach that we're taking in Boston. So. Before I get into equity, the second thing I'll say is 100 Resilient Cities has their framing for when they talk about resilience, and it's in the context of bad things happening, right? Um, and so in their context, the understanding that also those uh, chronic stresses, racism, poor infrastructure, investments, actually can lead to disasters in and of themselves. And you all have talked about some of these things, right? So Flint, right, Minneapolis Bridge Collapse, Baltimore, Ferguson, so we can keep going at these things that turned into these much larger events that required us to pay attention and address kind of the, the, the conflagration of all of those things coming together. So when we talk about equity, just to make sure we're on the same page, I'm going to be illustrative about this. So for those over here who can't see, I'll read it to you. I don't usually read this. But for a fair selection, everyone has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And for those who can't see the picture, it's a monkey, a penguin, an elephant, a goldfish. So it's the so I'll leave it there. And then the next one is, it's fair. Everyone gets an equal amount, right? Most people have seen some version of this one, usually in the inverted, looking over the fence. I have that one too, but it's a different spin on it. Um, but really, it's this idea that we live in a time where, where we have to be clear about what we're talking about. Lots of people get equity and equality confused, and it makes for difficult uh, conversations when we're not using the same language. So when we're talking about equality, we're talking about giving everyone the same thing, 
irrespective of the history, irrespective of the fact that people are not starting in the same place, right? And uh, equity is really about making sure that folks get what they need with the context of what the historical um, uh, pieces of our history uh, or historical context of what our communities have experienced. And this is a different spin on the equality equity baseball example. And this is how most residents feel, how most people, especially in marginalized communities, feel in terms of their reality versus these other two pieces, this uh, um, kind of intellectual debate about equality and equity. So the reason I start there is because when we think about um, all of the inequities that we see across communities, whether we're talking about Boston or whether we're talking about some other city uh, anywhere in the US and, and many times across the world, that many of those challenges are concentrated in our communities of color, not because of individual behavior. right? It's because of a long history of policies and practices that led us there. So being clear about that because it, it matters in how we think about solutions and ways that we can collectively work together in order to bring communities together, in order to have government and other institutions who are policymakers also think differently about how we approach these issues. Everyone still with me? Okay. So in resilience up to this point, um, it's really been very much focused on, in, both in terms of how we think about it and what people do. People think about climate change, people think about the economy, critical infrastructure, built environment, they think about stuff in place. We usually leave out the people. Um, and that starts right from the beginning. Usually when we do vulnerability assessments and we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we prioritize our resources in dealing with the threats and hazards that we face, and you all go through these processes when you're thinking about designing projects as well. And so people have to be part of that. And the reason that's so important um, is because all of the people that we're looking to support actually should be informing the way we're thinking about all of these different issues, right? People are at the core, and all of these things work in concert with thinking about what are the circumstances of the people that we're trying to serve, that we're trying to work with, that we're trying to partner with. And so it is not that they're equally weighted and that people is just one of those things we consider. It actually should be anchored in that, and that social resilience is the foundation of all other types of resilience, right? So that's the, that's the framing, that's where we're at for how we're talking about this in Boston. So when we're looking at those challenges of our communities, I'm going to give you some specific examples so that you have context on why we're talking about race, right? Because most people feel uncomfortable with that. I know. I get it. We feel uncomfortable when, we, when the words race are said, racism, um, and when we start talking about these things. And the research shows us this, that there's a physiological reaction mainly because we don't really talk about it in meaningful ways. We don't talk about it in a way where all voices are heard, where we're using the same language, or we're actually in the same conversation. And so, yes, it's uncomfortable because those conversations usually don't go well because no one ever taught us how to have those conversations or to be what the language actually means. Um, so getting to the same place. But before we get there, and before I go completely there, I'm going to talk a little bit about how some of these inequities are playing out in the city of Boston. So what I'm showing you right now is called the hotspot map. Usually you see it for crime data for these purposes. I'm use, using social data. Um, and it's really about the statistically highest concentrations of these different categories of circumstances our communities are dealing with or living in. So um, the darker the red, the more people there are statistically significantly. The darker the blue, those are cold spots. That means those are where the least amount of people who are dealing with these issues live. So you'll see there are some geographic patterns. How many people are familiar with Boston and the neighborhoods? We got some hands here, okay. So what I'll do is I'll use this as a way to just show the pattern, and I won't go into the weeds on the different neighborhoods. Is that okay? Okay, so social isolation, there is no data on explicitly on social isolation, but the research shows us that the most socialized, socially isolated people are generally older adults who live alone, single parents who don't have another adult in the household. So when we map that, that plays out in the same neighborhoods, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and parts of Hyde Park, right? So then when we think about low to no income, that again becomes a similar pattern. It gets us Dorchester, Roxbury, 
a part of South End, which is a development, um, why that's lit up, or a series of developments in that um, area. East Boston, development, plus low-income community. Alston Brighton, developments, plus immigrant communities, both Russian and Brazilian, um, and a few others, as well as lots of students. And, you know, as, as students, you'll know that doesn't help with the numbers. Um, so the conflagration of all of that in Alston Brighton is where you see, why you see those, that hot spot. People with disabilities concentrated in Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, that piece of East Boston, part of South End where the, the, the developments are, housing developments, because they accommodate people with disabilities. Limited English proficiency, same, similar pattern. Where do most people of color live? Similar pattern, and this is high statistical concentration. That doesn't mean there aren't any people of color in any, other, any of these other areas or for any of these issues, but high statistical concentration. And where are most of our children? Same neighborhoods, right? So we, we have some work to do. This is the urgency. This is the call to urgency because we have, we are a city that's predominantly people of color. And we have our highest concentration of children coming into a world where the presence of racism presents a number of barriers to those traditional trajectories of opportunities to success, right? So when we think about what racism actually is, I want to just be clear, I want to be explicit what I'm talking about. And so we're talking about a historically rooted system of power. I'm going to read this, this definition, which I don't usually do, but I think it's important to use the specific words. Um, is a historically rooted system of power, hierarchies based on race, infused in our institutions, our policies, and our culture that work better for white people than for people of color, color often unintentionally. So I want to be explicit about what we're talking about here, and this is not about blaming. I am not the race police. I am not here to call anyone anything. What we're focused on here is the inequities that we actually know exist in our communities based on the data and the research, not because Atiyah says so, but because lots of people across the world and across this country have come to the same conclusions. Um, and that we are really looking at how do we make sure that we're able to make to have a Boston that is united, a Boston where everyone has access to those opportunities I mentioned. So that means we focus on what we're going to do about it, not get lost in the history, informed by history, informed by those things, but making sure that we're focusing on how do we advance racial equity. And surprisingly, there are things that we can do. Sometimes folks feel like it's hopeless to feel like, well, you go to a thing and they're talking about racism and you end the conference, you end the workshop, and they're like, okay, so what do we do? And then there's usually crickets, right? Um, so from, a, from this perspective, it's about making sure that we're closing gaps so that our race doesn't predict our success. I mean, that's fundamentally what we're talking about, our outcomes. Right? And the challenge that we face is making sure that we have in place deliberate systems and processes and procedures that shift our practice from status quo, which perpetuates inequities, to be able to make sure that we have a customer service focus. And what I'm proposing isn't anything radical. It's nothing, you know, pulling it out of the sky. Really, we're talking about something that businesses do all the time. What is your target market? Who is this product or service for? so that you can make sure that it's actually going to meet their needs. And you can't do that without engaging people. You can't do that without acknowledging what their circumstances are. You can't do that without, under, without understanding um, how you can develop a relationship with them to build that trust for that brand long term. So this is something that's very logical and standard practice. We just don't think about it in the context of social challenges or government's role in advancing racial equity. But that's what we're trying to do, right? Um, so. As we think about uh, race and trauma, what I'm going to do is talk about how important this is um, in how we move forward in the conversation and into action. I'm not going to talk about that. So there's this amazing report that came out called the Adverse Community Experiences and Resilience. Um, and it's basically a framework for addressing and preventing community trauma. Has anyone heard of community or collective trauma before? Yes? What is it? Just quickly, what is it? If you had to sum it up. I, it's, it's the fact that you know, if environmental and social effects on a larger community, mm -hmm. which then does go to individuals. I mean, it can be you know, increased asthma, it can be uh, increased stress, it can be all those kind of things that affect the community as a whole. 
So all the types of things that are based in the environment and structure that contribute to the poor outcomes. Anyone else have anything to add to that? No? So usually when they're talking about collective trauma, it's not just the sum, as he pointed out, it's not just the sum of individual trauma, which we tend to focus on kind of when, when there's a suicide, when there's a homicide, when there's a shooting, swoop in, how do we give better trauma services? That's one piece and that's a necessary part. The other part is recognizing the, sh so structural violence, most people understand what that means in the context of how do we um, better understand the way that structural inequities um, based on systemic oppression, systemic racism, has led to certain outcomes in communities. And what this report is ve very uniquely does um, is takes lots of different um, approaches and pulls it all together and says there's actually symptoms of this. And you can look at a community and tell if they're suffering from community trauma, which is something that I hadn't heard framed in that way before. And I think it's just very helpful for um, conversations about working with communities and in communities. So when they talk about those community symptoms, they talk about three major areas, equitable opportunity, they talk about place, which is very relevant for here, and we're talking about people and the relationship between the three and that when you look at communities who have been affected by community trauma, there's usually intergenerational poverty. None of this is going to surprise people, right? Because we see this all the time if you've been in communities, right? <coughs> Unemployment, disinvestment, deteriorated environments, unhealthy, dangerous public spaces, crumbling built environment, disconnected, damaged relationships, destructive so social norms, and low sense of political social efficacy. That's kind of a lot that they've kind of packed all in there that I've never seen kind of quite pulled together in that way. But again, it's grounding for us to make sure that we're taking this into consideration and using it as a foundation for how we engage with folks. So then we have, well, what do we do about that? How do we better understand um, what we should be doing and what a resilient community looks like based on um, the context of community trauma. And so we have this equitable opportunity. What are the types of actions that we should be doing to make sure that happens? So making sure there's economic empowerment, workforce development, investment in resources, and that the way we approach justice is in a restorative way and that is very much rooted in cultural norms and um, in, in approaches that are relevant to the communities that we're, we're serving. Um, also looking at how we help to rebuild relationships and networks in communities. How do we strengthen healthy social norms, promote community connection, um, which is a huge part of the, the resilient strategy, how we're looking at it, um, as well as kind of all of these pieces around place that you all are very familiar with in terms of the importance of green space, importance of quality, um, safe space, um, the importance of investing in housing and improving built environment, and the, and the way that all of those pieces come together. And on the other end, what does a resilient community look like from the context of addressing community trauma, which again is coming from those structural and systemic inequities. Um, and so this has been uh, very helpful for me as I think about what our communities are struggling with. And as we think about community engagement, whether you're government or another institution, whether you're doing design or planning, working with communities, that we recognize that when we talk about building community trust, the way we frame it and the way it's often talked about is in, the, is, is in a way that indicates, I don't know why there's no community trust. We just have to figure out how we build it without a recognition of the, of the history, without a recognition that there is, there's a reason there's, there's lack of trust and there's a history of promises not being kept. There's a history of purposeful policies and practices that have led to the inequities that these communities are facing and dealing with. And so the idea that we're, 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 when we're going in and we're trying to build relationships, that there's a recognition of those things. Um, that's kind of the beginning and that the idea is that the relationship is as long term as it can be or rooted in relationships with other organizations who do have those long term anchored relationships within communities. So the reason why that is so powerful in the framing is because what we usually do is we chase symptoms. 
We say there's violence in these communities. And so there must be things that we can help individuals do. And therefore, we're going to have this program or service that's going to chase all these different sy symptoms, right? But really, what we want to do is look at root cause. Public health has been doing this for since its inception, right? Looking at root cause, looking at how issues are impacting our communities, our populations, and looking at what policies institutions and the structures that are engaged with communities, serving communities, what they can do in order to address the bigger picture root cause issues. And in this case, what we're really talking about is racism. So the way Boston's approach is, um, is because we have 100 resilient cities, the grant, which was pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation. I won't get into the weeds on this. I will say the idea here is that the Rockefeller Foundation wanted to make sure that cities were using a, a resilience approach that was looking at the most pressing issues and challenges that we tend to shy away from to be able to make sure that we're focusing on them and looking at how do we work collaboratively across issue areas, across different sectors to be able to do this work and that it would spark the, the willingness of other cities who weren't part of 100 Resilient Cities in order to kind of take that same path. And we're already seeing some of that with some cities, even in the US who are hiring chief resilience officers even though they don't receive the grant. So for this process, I won't get into the weeds on process for time's sake, but what I'll say is there are three phases. It's not a lot of time. The first phase is about five months, and I'm, I'm wrapping up that first phase now because today's April first. Um, and so we'll be releasing our preliminary resilience assessment, which talks about what we did, what we heard from community members. I'll talk a little bit about what that engagement was, what we're doing in Boston, not just in government, but some of our community partners, and what does some of the research tell us that can help us with the framing. The second phase is really about digging deeper into the priorities that folks identified, making sure that we're using um, research, making sure that we're using it as an opportunity to really understand at the core of these issues so that a working group can help us with actionable strategies rooted in community context, so there'll be a series of engagement to make sure that we get communities um, feedback on the different priorities and what they would want a working group to be thinking about as they um, look to collaborate and, and um, bring resources together. Um, and then we'll be finished with that process starting July, uh, July, August. And then we will do some work planning and then we transition into the doing of things. That's really fast. Anyone who's done a strategic planning process, even just for an institution, knows that this is really fast. And we have the we have the the, the fortune and the great privilege in Boston that there's so many planning processes that have happened in the past that are happening that it allowed to be able to pull from a lot of what people have already done, because communities have been telling us the same things for a long time. Um, and so when I looked back and then I looked at the engagement that I did, it was very clear that. People are still saying the same thing, so that means we still have some work to do around these very specific issues, which I have all of this like built up suspense. You're like, what are the issues? Um, it's coming, I promise. Um, so in order to get to them, uh, to those resilience themes, those priorities, I had 164 meetings between September and January with over 500 stakeholders within government leadership, our cabinet um, members, uh, our department heads, met with community organizations, advocacy groups, private sector partners, um, met with some residents uh, in order to really think about what are we doing well and where do we need to, where there's lots of room for improvement. Um, and, and people were very vocal about letting me know those things. Um, and so I also did five workshops with a, another 123 people people really focused in on this specific conversation. The rest of them are just like high level engagements to get people um, up to speed on what we were doing and how we were doing the process and what stage we were at. So this is for illustrative purposes only. So this is what we did with all of that feedback in order to see where we were going to focus um, our efforts in the whole spectrum of what the ecosystem of a city is and how it operates um, in the context of resilience. So be able to focus in on where was the weight um, in terms of what people wanted to talk about. So then we looked at what are the existing things happening in the community in government and compared the two, right? 
So there's some comparison that happened. And then we said, well, let's take some preliminary overview of the research to make sure we have the context right. And we came up with this. Resilience themes, yay, we got here. So really, I already talked about this, that our cross-cutting theme is really about advancing racial equity and strengthening social cohesion. This is what anchors everything. It is a body of work in and of itself because there's a lot to do around this. Um, one of, I'll, I'll share with you just a handful of things that have been proposed and some things that are in the works, just at, by the nature of beginning to have these conversations. So the city of Boston will be joining the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, which is a national coalition of cities and uh, regional government like counties um, in some states who are really looking at how do you operationalize equity in government. What does that actually mean and look like? And this is really important because, not just because it's the right thing to do, um, but because equity is one of the four pillars of government, which most people aren't aware of. It is what we are supposed to be doing. We just haven't been doing it. And since 2005, um, it has been one of the four pillars of government. So it's been, a, and before then it was about economy, how much we're spending, it was about efficiency, how are processes and systems working, um, it was about effectiveness, how um, are the, the outcomes of the things that we're doing, are we achieving what we want it to achieve, and now equity, asking this additional question of four individuals we know are disproportionately burdened by inequities, in this case, people of color, what how will this policy or practice burden them further? And if it does, why? And is this what we should really be doing? And if it's something that we don't, can't figure out another alternative to doing, how are you going to mitigate the burden on those communities? Right? So asking some upfront questions, because these are the things that are going to come back to us anyways. Right? So might as well be upfront about them. And, and there's some very specific opportunities around budget filters, around thinking differently about basic practices. I'll give you an example. So how, how does anyone know how street um, how sidewalks get fixed in terms of the process. Most people call a number and say, the sidewalk needs to be fixed. And then they come out and they fix the sidewalk. But who are the folks who are connected to the systems that make those calls? The people who are already in, if we have disadvantaged neighborhoods, we have advantaged neighborhoods, right? So it's the folks in advantaged neighborhoods predominantly making those calls. So that means the other neighborhoods aren't getting their sidewalks fixes regularly. And so instead of relying on a complaint-based approach, what's the policy level approach that we can take? And that policy level approach is to say, well, the folks who are most dependent on sidewalks being um, well kept together are people with disabilities, right? And so we need to make sure that we understand within those neighborhoods where there are high concentrations of people with disabilities that we've actually gone in and fixed the sidewalks in those areas because those people depend on them the most. Where are the most families, right? And looking at the whole map to see what are the, where are the places where we've invested a lot in and where are the places where we haven't invested as much in and being very intentional. And then once you get that on a cycle where it's everyone on a regular basis is getting their sidewalks maintained once you kind of level that playing field of get to that, uh, address the equity issue, then it becomes a policy that benefits everyone because now no one has to call 311 to fix the stupid sidewalk, right? So it benefits everyone. When we take a higher level perspective, and the reason why this is so important, the one of the reasons why this is so important is because many times the systems that don't work for people of color are the systems that don't work for everyone anyways. Right. So this is the, the, the type of thinking, new ways of thinking, of just asking some additional questions and raising the bar in terms of why we're doing certain things. Um, the other piece of the resilience themes came in the context of uh, folks wanted to, to make sure that this process was institutionalized, that the things we were learning from going through um, how we did this as well as what recommendations come out of the working groups, that there is a way to make sure that within government, as we were looking at planning processes, that we were aligning with these different issue areas that rose up to the top, um, and that we were sharing that with our other institutional partners and with other community organizations. Um, household economic resilience, how do we make sure that there's 
as access to asset building? What are the barriers to asset building? And how do we better understand those? Critical infrastructure resilience. How do we make sure that the infrastructure that our communities depend on is actually serving all residents, particularly those who are most vulnerable? Community governance resilience. How do we facilitate governance, facilitate community governance in the delivery of city services? Right. So this is the importance of voice being heard. This is also important to addressing that community trauma, because part of the community trauma is being used to your voice not being heard. Right? And so when there's an opportunity for the voice to be heard and there's actually action taken based on that input, it begins to build a type, rebuild the type of trust that we're talking about with our communities, because at the end of the day, in order to build trust, it's in the doing, not what you say. You know, we tell our children all the time, listen with your eyes. Right? So that's what, we're, that's what really happens in real life. And so we, it's in how we're actually working on projects and initiatives with communities. Um, and then also how we're supporting the, the building of and support of um, community leadership and civic engagement. And the last one is about community psychological resilience. I won't go into this because I went into it earlier. Um, but it is a priority both at the individual level and at the collective level as it relates to the cross-cutting theme of racial equity and social cohesion. So I'll just wrap up in two slides, one by saying that in Boston, we often talk about one Boston, and as if we mean everyone, but we know that everyone is not included in that one Boston. So this is about getting us to the place where that is the process. And now I am under no illusion that this, um, this grant funding is going to fix all of this. The idea is that we lay the foundation and the infrastructure and the structure to be able to make sure that it gets institutionalized and that we're, we're tracking and we're being methodical about measuring, about looking at outcomes. And so I'll share my favorite quote that with, along with this theme of work, because we have work to do, um, that most people don't recognize opportunity because it comes disguised as hard work. And this is the relationship of all of us rolling up our sleeves and being able to get in, put our brains together, put our experience together, rooted in research, rooted in data, not opinions and anecdotes, right, and conversations that we had with constituents, like three constituents, right, but making sure that we are really rooted in the methodical approaches that will get us to the outcomes we're trying to achieve, and we're measuring our progress towards this on a regular basis. So I'm going to be quiet there, because I'm sure it is hot. People are probably ready for me to stop now. And we're going to transition into the next portion. So good? OK. OK, so in the interest of time, we're going to um, hold questions. Atia will be joining us for the discussion after um, the student presentation. So if you have questions for her, there'll be an opportunity um, to discuss that at, after the presentation. So if everyone wants to take a quick stretch and reorient and get some, try to get some people on this side of the room so everyone can have a seat. And we'll start pretty quickly. Thank you. Got it. Which one? What? What? <laughs> Started. Yeah, 
that is there, that we had that time. We see them waiting. I have to have more in my bag. The thing that led that opportunity and how I worked along this place, I did for that for myself. Is it the tea of that part that brought it back up? Okay, everyone, I know there's lots of good conversations happening, but we want to make sure we have time for questions in the discussion. So I'm going to please ask everyone to take a seat. 
Um, and we're going to get started with this second um, student presentation, um, presentations and, and discussion portion of the day. I think there's you. I think so for right now we're going to have six students that are going to come up and present, and then we're going to call for the panel. All right. Thanks. But hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Rauhut. I'm an MR2 student. Um, the project I'm going to present today, I probably should be calling it Equitable Opportunity Housing, I'm realizing. Um, but it was done uh, in Dan Doka's studio last semester uh, for the MLK Way. It was a studio looking at uh, race uh, and the history of segregation in American cities, particularly in St. Louis and uh, Washington, D.C. Um, so basically, my project started um, on the ground realizing the, the, the disparate uh, housing uh, in St. Louis. Um, there's a lot of affluent white suburban housing in St. Louis and a lot of um, impoverished African-American housing in northern St. Louis. Um, it started as a mapping exercise looking at um, race distributions within St. Louis. So this is a map showing uh, dark blue is African-American and then the lighter blue is um, uh, white. And you can see that there's a direct correspondence between um, areas of low opportunity, uh, areas of African Americans uh, in Section 8 and voucher-based housing. Uh, it's really unfortunate, I and mean, it's a situation that affects a lot of American cities. Uh, recently, it's been ruled by the uh, Supreme Court as being uh, in violation of the Fair Housing Act and something that local CDCs will need to be, uh, be addressing. Uh, but there's a large uh, kind of um, instance uh, of sort of uh, distributions of unequal opportunity uh, in relation to race and income. Um, some of the lowest performing schools are in predominantly African-American neighborhoods. Um, there's not a single hospital in North St. Louis that serves the African community. Um, access to finance is also segregated. Um, and so the project started looking at um, basically developing uh, mixed income housing developments uh, in search of a better neighborhood. Um, and so this was sort of the hypothetical people we were designing for. Um, people from North St. Louis and then also people from the suburbs in order to sort of create a more integrated city. Uh, and we were looking at sort of, you know, trying to find these elements of a good neighborhood and where to locate them. And so kind of the strategy was instead of taking these kind of depressing maps uh, and sort of just not knowing what to do with them, it was sort of flipping them and using them as a filter. Um, so basically looking at areas of highest opportunity, then looking at areas of good education outcomes, areas of good health, uh, areas of higher employment, uh, higher income, and sort of using that to filter down to find a site for a mixed income housing development. So kind of as proof of concept, this is the site, um, just sort of really just based off of raw data, looking to find a place of high opportunity, and this is what it looks like on the ground. So I think it's kind of obvious that this is maybe an area of higher opportunity. Um, so then the project was basically about trying to develop a mixed income housing development within this area. There's uh, fortunately a lot of uh, large vacant uh, public land that could be used for a certain development like that. Uh, and then this just sort of walks through um, the design, you know, developing some typical uh, suburban units um, focused around a community center. Uh, when we were speaking to people in St. Louis, especially people within this, uh, working at the CDCs, um, they'd mentioned that there is, you know, because African Americans for the longest time have had a history of being excluded from the suburban environment, there is this kind of um, uh, desire to be living in a, a less dense area. Um, so this is a, just sort of some quick slides of the development. So I'll have to go quickly. And then we also did, um, I also did a, a, a design for a proposal in the city that would be for um, students uh, at the University of St. Louis uh, in the social justice uh, school. Um, it'd be a co-housing unit for um, African-American uh, residents, locals, and then also students. Just kind of quickly going through the slides. There'd be sort of a, uh, an open market there too as well. Um, and then sort of all of this was compiled into these two uh, packages that are going to get sent over to the CDCs in St. Louis so they can start to use this uh, project as a way to kind of, you know, start some internal discussions to start thinking about locating uh, developments outside of uh, low opportunity areas and into higher opportunity areas. And so made some uh, packets as well for that. And that, that's it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sean. Um, I'm a third year MR1 student. So these are scenes that we are all familiar with. The divide between those who have and those who don't. 
And this is no different in Indonesia. For those of you who don't know where that is, I've Googled it for you. <laughs> yeah. So what we see as green fields and brochures for new, urban, new urbanism style gated communities are in reality home to a thriving, healthy community. We have the divide, the middle class and people from the lower class. The developer steps in and the lower class is evicted. When we destroy an informal settlement, we also destroy the embedded logics and networks of codependency that have been built up over time. As much as the city continues to reject and push these communities in further into its peripheries, the city cannot exist without its shanty town. The project task asks, is the divide between the classes softer than we imagine it to be? And what if we acknowledge this codependency and celebrate this parasitical marriage? This project therefore investigates the possibility of expanding a city without expunging the informal settlements that surround it. In other words, the middle and lower classes are moving in together. What then is the container for this to happen? And there are lessons from past attempts to house people from kampongs, which are the informal settlements. Yep. So a lot of it, it has to do with um, the way it's been approached from a modernist point of view by building high-rise, high-density buildings. Uh, sorry. Okay. And we can look at what's typically, typically done by developers. What we have are just stylized facades on very generic floor plans. And perhaps this is where intervention can take place. So the main idea is to reconfigure the middle class house as infrastructure for self-help incremental housing to take place. So you know it's a bit of architecture there, whereby you modify the typical middle class house to form infrastructure for infill by uh, the lower classes. So depending on your economic status, you can put in whatever material that suits your budget. And what you have is like a, a, a two classes house in a single compact unit. In the aggregation of these units, studies were done to ensure that issues of access and privacy were accounted for. And this is what it looks like in plan. So the, a lot of the difficulty was trying to figure out what each class valued. So the middle classes, they valued just the, uh, the idea of a pristine front. But in reality, they still love a bargain. So this is what it looks like on the front. And in the back is where uh, these uh, re rehouse informal settlements are. And so that's what it looks like for uh, life and activity. So there's a section through it. So, yeah, Urbanists and sociologists have long called for a mixing of classes since segregation ultimately ends up in social disease. But if you forget about high theory for a while, but instead look at what's happening on the streets of Jakarta and take an ethnographic stance, we already see this mixing that's happening, even in more expensive neighborhoods. And perhaps what is proposed here might not seem to, to be too far from reality. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, my name is um, Elaine Stokes and I'm part of the uh, landscape department here and I'll be showing some of my work from my current in progress thesis, um, which is titled Restructuring the Edgelands and is cited along the Hodemont right of way, which runs through North St. Louis. Um, so, at its core, this thesis asserts that in cities of dispersal where populations are declining and open land is becoming abundant, um, the landscape architect is uniquely positioned to operate at a scale that addresses the minimal productivity pervasive in these urban environments. Specifically, the spatial boundaries that organize cities today frequently limit rather than facilitate innovative use and occupation of land, particularly due to the standard practice of maintenance regimes for vacant property. So by merging privately and publicly owned land into a continuous network and using the Hodemont right-of-way as a prototype, um, a wider variety of incubator industries can co-inhabit the uh, urban space, establishing a commerce that supports local residents while also forming um, a new typology of urban space that's centered around production. So here you can see um, the westernmost uh, entrance of the Hodemont. And um, when I'm talking about minimal productivity here, I'm referring to a kind of threefold um, aspect. So the value of the majority of the vacant land among, along the Hodemont does not 
promote a productive social environment because there's very little programming of these spaces and it really does not facilitate interaction amongst um, neighbors. It also does not promote ecological productivity because most of the vacant land along this site is simply mowed in terms of maintenance, so it doesn't allow the production of habitat. And finally, there's very little uh, economic productivity um, because this uh, the intense vacancy here is really detracting from land value. So. Um, however, the Hodemont is very uniquely positioned within the city, so the Hodemont zone is highlighted in yellow here, um, and it runs between several major educational and um, cultural institutions connecting uh, Washington University, St. Louis University, and then Grand Center, which is kind of on the um, far right of the image. Um, and so it also runs through and abuts several uh, very low access um, neighborhoods where there's really low income. Those are highlighted in the hatched gray um, and also the lowest car ownership. So these, these neighborhoods are very, um, have very limited mobility. Um, so what I'm working on currently, and this is in progress, is seven types of in industries seen here which would serve as the driver for social, ecological, and economic engagement along the Hodemont. Um, so here I'm evaluating these industries on a number of criteria and proposing um, a method of gradual phasing where each activity feeds into the next. Um, so. In this way, a variety of zones would emerge along the Hodemont, each with a unique internal focus, but also overlaying into a complex system where agroforestry, composting, residential deconstruction, land art, and transportation would build upon one another. And while these proposals, uh, this proposal focuses primarily on the Hodemont, which is in the brightest green along the middle, it is also understood as um, a resource for the neighborhoods both north and south of the line where there's very diverse socioeconomic and racial neighborhoods. Um, so most essentially would create a network of open space that encourages a safe public sphere while also embracing productive landscapes. And rather than subdividing the corridor into sections of recreation or transportation or industry, the idea is to overlay a palimpsest of all three such that there is a dynamic corridor that evolves along the three and a half mile site. Um, and so just to wrap up, um, the Hodemont in this project is not considered an insular um, space. Rather, it is understood as a prototype for other corridors of vacancy within the city um, where these industries that are being explored along the Hodemont could be expanded and tested at a greater scale. In this way, the Hodemont produces a new ecological industry for St. Louis while also providing a highly accessible corridor of public space that establishes a greater sense of ownership in North St. Louis. Thank you. Can everybody see me? <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Yina. I'm at MRC1, uh, graduating in May. Um, my, I'm presenting my thesis, uh, Losing as Frame, the Cruise Terminal as a Landscape of Cultural Production and Sustainable Development. Traveling used to be all about the destinations. The idea that the ocean can be crossed and the other side can be reached used to be exciting. The ocean liners a distinguished, dis distinguished tool of mobility that enabled industrialization, development, and trade is today a relic of the past. When commercial jet planes came into market in the 60s, many of the displaced ocean liners were then remodeled into cruise ships, giving rise to the cruise industry. And then over the years, the ships become heavier and bigger, carrying more and more passengers at once. The ship as an artifact has changed from a symbol of industrialized infrastructure to a symbol of leisure. The proliferation of the ship has grown to the extent that some writers would argue that there is no destination anymore. Uh, the destination is the ship itself. But this thesis makes the case for the revival of the destination in the future cruise industry. Krista Thompson was the first to use the term uh, tropicalization to describe the complex visual systems through which the islands were imaged for tourist consumption and the social and political implications of these representations on actual physical spaces. Um, the way that uh, sorry, the way that cruise terminals are um, designed uh, today uh, and represented continue to support that. 
the image of the terminal is highly controlled to the extent um, that a physical boundary is imposed. So this is a current uh, terminal map of my site uh, in Bailey City. And the city proper uh, here is rendered formless in this representation. So basically the sky area is the city. And then, you know, it's the city and the sea. Uh, the tourist, uh, therefore, literally does not move beyond the artificial boundary of the cruise terminal, while the locals are banned from entering. So this is a real picture that a tourist took uh, of a barbed wire um, in uh, Haiti. And economically, although the host country receives some money from renting out the port land, not a single dollar spent by the tourists within the terminals actually flows into the local economy. Um, so here we see the green bar uh, representing other ship expenses, port fees, et cetera, literally uh, vanished by 2015, too thin to be represented. Um, but at the same time, although cruise companies are pocketing a lot of money um, from the current passengers who are typically baby boomer Americans, um, the thesis argues that the business model is not sustainable unless they just start designing for the future uh, cruisers uh, who are really us today here, uh, the students, who are millennials who prefer experiences and authenticity. Uh, and some of these future cruisers are extreme explorers who actually spend months on cargo ships to see the world. So the ship becomes irrelevant uh, in reality. It's time to involve the destination in the design of cruise terminals. Um, so this thesis takes uh, the case of Bailey City. Uh, Belize is a small country flanking the east of other popular Caribbean destinations. Uh, it's still a small market in terms of tourists, but their, their uh, tourist sector has grown over a thousand percent since 2001. So the thesis takes the opportunity uh, to offer a reimagination of its existing cruise terminal and propose a design method that uh, can be and should be tailored to the opportunities uh, at different destinations. So in the case of Belize, um, the livelihood depends on its rich forest and its development need can be addressed by an increase of skilled laborers uh, to add value to these raw materials. Uh, so the cruise terminal is uh, not just a cruise terminal, it is a vocational school for both Belizean middle to high school students. The main move in programmatic adjacency is to pair each market with its production facilities for the production of the very things they're selling in the shops, uh, which are at once training facilities. Uh, local skills can be cultivated in these production facilities, but the spectacle of both also creates a didactic experience uh, as the tourists move through the overlap spaces. So this is uh, the general plan uh, showing the market spaces here flanked by production spaces um, and the experience really about kind of going through them as an urban experience. Um, here uh, is some diagram supporting the design uh, of campus and market being also both a didactic path of kind of ordering disciplines or ordering traits. Um, and this is a collage of the path and some studies of how to redesign that boundary uh, in an urban scale. Um, so lastly, I would say um, the project's really about uh, kind of curating this reciprocal relationship uh, where the ship represents a dynamic reservoir of constantly renewed information and knowledge manifested in each shipload of tourists arriving from all over the world, just like the internet in a way. And it's a relationship that uh, continually, continually generate change in each other. Every day there is a cruise docked off the source of Bailey City for nine hours with an average of 3,000 passengers. How might we better capture the potentials in this interaction to generate benefits for both sides? These nine hours can be spent in learning about local trades and resources and even offering impromptu lectures and conversations. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Tamo Tsuito. Uh, I'm a second year student, and I'm uh, presenting the Option Studio uh, last year, uh, instructed by Dan Dioka. And the uh, title is uh, Making Community Art Space Together. And the site was the Central Ice Rip. It's uh, one of the uh, suburban communities in Suffolk County, Long Island, New York. 
and uh, this is a uh, Margarita Espada, who is an artist, and uh, dealing with the, such kind of social problem, uh, which is very typical in the suburban Long Island context, uh, like a uh, um, weak immigrant integration, uh, immigrants from the different countries, or uh, lack of parent food for children, school segregation, and aloofness to political engagement. And uh, uh, she uh, wants to establish a community art center to integrate this community together. So we met uh, Margarita in September, and uh, she wanted to us to design a one stage to establish a uh, art center. So this is a site, and uh, which has uh, two buildings and a huge, um, huge gardens, uh, and uh, touches to the street. And uh, this is uh, just a quick look of the site. And uh, this is a building, and uh, this is an interior, which is going to be a uh, theater space or staging space. So um, after the visit, uh, we try to design a three scale of the design, and uh, which in terms of also in terms of the scale, and which is also in terms of the timeline. And uh, step one is a very small one, uh, stage or furniture or interior as a quick step. So uh, based on the, their vision of the art center, um, they actually want not only a theater, but, but also they want uh, some class for art or like a painting class or guitar concert. So um, we uh, vision some like a transformable furniture and discuss with the Margarita and the local stakeholders like this. And uh, finally, we came up with the idea of the four units of furniture, which can be a stage, uh, but can be also a, a set of the table and chairs. And uh, we we care the module coordination so that we it can have uh, many uh, arrangements, and uh, which can be very uh, different um, arrangement. And the color scheme is came from the um, like their home home country's flag. So, and the uh, middle scale is uh, about the uh, exterior space, but I'm go quickly, but just to, just to uh, basically uh, um, pro uh, responsible to the, uh, their uh, needs and the desires. And uh, the bigger scale about uh, how to engage the um, community uh, in larger scale. And uh, uh, we propose some inventory system uh, to think about thinking about the uh, art center as a social, uh, how to say, collective social capitalist, uh, so social capital, and, uh, and which uh, exchange uh, not only a furniture or like a people who run the guitar and the like a, who can go to the concert. And uh, I wanted to, we wanted to uh, realize a first step uh, within the semester. And uh, we we arranged uh, several workshops. And uh, one thing is an online survey. And uh, two and three is a uh, local construction and the public imagination workshop on site. Uh, we did in the Thanksgiving break. And uh, we did we prepared some construction manual and uh, some tools and uh, made uh, furniture actually together with uh, local people. And uh, this event was actually uh, one one aspect to integrate the community at first. And we painted, and uh, we complete, and uh, this is a stage. Yeah. And uh, uh, at the same time of the construction, we did uh, some uh, utilizing workshop uh, using the one to ten scale model, and uh, and uh, imagine uh, and uh, engage the local people to how uh, they want to use the that furniture in the future. And uh, we we uh, propose a tag and. Uh, and the road write down and the published um, in the wall. And we made some um, preparation and some trial for the exterior design. And uh, we also did uh, some survey, uh, not on, in addition to the online survey at uh, that day. So we learned a lot uh, from that uh, design process and the workshop. So, and uh, after the workshop, I uh, we wrapped up some, like uh, what we learned from that. Um, workshop and uh, experience, and uh, I w we wanted to improve somehow about our uh, next step design, and uh, uh, but uh, the semester uh, close is really nearly the end. So, uh, but uh, we, so we cannot stay uh, <laughs> stay at the um, 
stay at the site all the time, but uh, we wanted to have some like a pro proactive design uh, into the community to leave the to leave some cut to see to have uh, some catalyst for people to um, think and imagine their future of the design. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Michael Mayo. I'm an architecture student here. And I'm presenting my thesis work, which is a project called Todos in BC, which means everyone on bikes. And it's, uh, it's a nomadic experiment of sorts in design, in which I led a group of 22 cyclists of all ages and abilities uh, across one of the most rural roads, one of the most rural desert roads in the continent, uh, through Baja California. And through the journey, we collectively created uh, a platform for exchange, for experience, for storytelling. Um, and the project comes from, uh, well, it stems from an urban investigation called NBC, which is made possible by the Mexican Cities Initiative, in which me and my research partner, Carlos Ignacio Hernandez Tellez, were exploring the bicycle as a critical tool of urban resilience in Mexico City, one of the most congested cities on the planet. So we were exploring the ways in which people are using the bicycle not only to survive in the city, but to, uh, but to thrive. Um, as everyday urbanists, our bicycles were our mobile research camp. Basically, all of our time, 10 hours a day, was spent on bicycles, meeting cyclists from all over the city, cyclists of all walks of life, uh, from people who either found their bikes in the garbage, people whose entire livelihood is their bicycle, bakers, water vendors, water delivery people, selling things off of their bikes, mechanics, hipsters on bicycles, trying to really discover the whole ecosystem of bicycling subcultures in this really dense, congested city. Um, an important element of our research was joining people in their urban journeys uh, and filming all the while. The, the camera was an important lens for us to help communicate the, the story of each and every individual cyclist. Um, and then also there was the, the quantitative component where we were mapping people's rides. Uh, and then the more qualitative component where we were exploring notions of, of how the bicycles transform one's experience of the city, how it's rendered certain areas of the city more accessible to them, how it's transformed their perception of scale, speed in the city. Um, and so the space of the interview really became the space in which people were able to communicate their stories. Uh, and throughout the course of the research, we biked over 6,300 kilometers all over the city and develop this incredible network of collaborators, of bicyclists, of activists, of policymakers working with mobility infrastructure, um, basically bikers of all kinds. And so this is where Tholos in BC comes from. So uh, what, what I was seeing from this urban research was this latent desire, this, this potential to start to connect a lot of these disparate constituencies, all sorts of different organizations and, bike, uh, and bikers through the design of an experience. Um, and so Dolos in BC is really premised on diversity, inclusion, um, and accessibility. So in this group of 22, there were blind cyclists, there were deaf cyclists, there were amputees, there were riders as young as 12, there was riders as young as 60. And what we were really trying to do was bring together people who have very, very distinct ways of perceiving their world and, and diving deep into this, this, this platform that we were creating, this, this safe space that we were creating, the space of interrogation and sharing. Um, and so a really important element of this project was designing the group, was finding the participants. Um, and so I'll just introduce you to a couple of people. This is Jose Conejo, which means rabbit in Spanish. Um, he plays with the Amputee Soccer League in Mexico City. Uh, he lost his leg 10 years ago. He hadn't been on a bike since. And what's interesting, what you'll see in this project is basically a lot of the participants are a minority of sorts trying to adapt and live in a world that's been designed for majority. So for example, with Jose, he has a very particular way of moving about the city, a city that's very inaccessible, very dense and congested. Um, and so we started biking together on a tandem bike on weekends in Mexico City. And the first time we hopped on a tandem bike together, um, we were both a little bit nervous because we didn't know what the dynamic would be, if we'd be able to stay up or anything. We launched. I turned around and we both started to cry. Like it was one of the most beautiful moments I've ever had on a bike. You know, this person that's been walking very slowly throughout a city is now cutting through it. Uh, I really believe deeply in the bicycle as a vehicle for social change, as a lens, as a way of perceiving your world. Uh, this is Brisa. Uh, her name means Breeze. She's a computer scientist. Choco's in front. He's a uh, activist and bike mechanic. 
Um, Brizo was actually taught how to ride a bike by another participant in the journey who runs this uh, feminist biking collective that teaches women how to bike in busy urban streets on, on Mexico City highways. Um, this is Israel, the youngest participant. Uh, he's 12 years old. He's from Iztapalapa. And, uh, and the other interesting thing about this design project was also designing trust, designing uh, uh, the proposal was quite outrageous, you know, asking people to bike a thousand miles across one of the most rural roads on the continent on a bicycle. Um, this is uh, Hernan and Marta. Hernan is a deaf cyclist. Marta is a blind cyclist. Marta was my partner in the journey. We rode on a tandem bike together. Um, one of the most beautiful things about this project is you, you start to see all these new languages emerge because you have blind cyclists communicating with deaf cyclists, communicating with Spanish speakers, communicating with English speakers. And so the most common language became this language of touch, this language of movement. Everything kind of became a dance. People use less words, and their, their, their actual communication became more big, more bodily. Um, in making this project possible, I mean, it was very much a design project, an architected project. I had to design an identity for the project, design a way of communicating this project. As an architect, I very much identify as a storyteller. I use storytelling as as a, a vehicle for moving projects forward. And that's how I built trust. That's how I created buy-in. Um, for this particular project, I had to raise $15,000 in two months to keep it accessible, you know, find 12 bikes for you know, half of the people that didn't have bicycles that wanted to participate, because accessibility was key in creating the diversity necessary for this project to really thrive. Um, and then there was a whole series of, of design tools that I incorporate into the project and a pedagogy of sorts that really catalyzed uh, the exchange that was happening. Um, so one of these elements was the collective camera. Uh, I'm producing a documentary about the whole experience, and the documentary is very much a participatory work. So we had this participatory camera, and every morning one of the partners would pull out of a bag an element. Um, and these elements we had decided upon before the trip as a group. These elements included bodies, language, earth, wind, water, food, the elements of our journey. And so every day somebody would pull uh, an element out of the bag and that'd be the focus for this collective camera. Um, and then a really important tool was this participatory map, this piece of canvas that became our platform, our, our, our storybook of sorts. Uh, both, it was both a retrospective tool and a, and a tool that projected forward. Um, it, if you look closely, the, it's basically the original map was just the outline of Baja California, the peninsula, and then the highway itself, and it was sewn on to have texture so that the blind participants could also read the map. They could see the proximity of the road to the coast. They can fill the, the beads, which were cities, the distance between towns. And then also what it did was it created a, a new standard of language, because what this trip really did was destroy the idea of normal, of a normal body, of normal beauty, of normal language. And so through this map, people were able to, to communicate equally. The, the deaf participants were able to draw. People who could hear with their ears, speak with their mouth, can, could see the map. And then also the last element uh, were these empathetic activities, these activities that we, we designed together that really provided a bridge between your distinct way of viewing the world and my distinct way of viewing the world. So this was the most important part of the journey. So for example, New Year's Eve, we spent the entire evening blindfolded. Uh, we went into the New Year blindfolded, all 22 of us, which was a really important initial exercise in helping us to empathize with the experience of biking across a desert blind. So there were 22 of us cooking, eating together, moving about the desert, all blindfolded. After all these empathetic activities, there'd be a space for discussion. This was one of the most exciting days. It was two weeks into the trip. It was a uh, mile 900. Um, we spent an entire 24 hours without speaking a single spoken word. So imagine that 22 people waking up on a, on a rural desert beach, having to cook together, having to take down camp, having to bike 100 miles, having to go into a taqueria and order tacos without speaking, even though you've never, had, you've never faced that kind of uh, form of communication before. Um, this was an activity that we designed with Conejo, the amputee football player, soccer player. Um, he had everyone put their hands in their pants and we played a soccer game um, because basically when, when you have an arm tied behind you, you move very differently, you kind of lose your balance. And so after that, we had a whole discussion about Conejo's experience of, of having to adapt his body to a tool built for somebody with two legs. Um, I spent a, an entire day and a half blindfolded with my writing partner, Marta, uh, which was an incredible experience for me. And she was, she was my guide for that entire uh, day. And then 
this whole project's being communicated through uh, what I'm producing now, this participatory documentary that explores perceptions of, uh, of bodies, of language, and, and explores the space of our, or tries to communicate the space of our collective imagination that we built through this journey. And there's more on NBC.com, uh, lots of narrative videos and interviews. And the debut will be April 27th at the GSD. Thanks. Wow, thanks so much. Those are all incredible and inspiring. Um, and I know everyone smells the pizza, but we are going to have a brief um, discussion period. So if I can ask all the presenters um, and our guest commentators, David Harvey and Atia Martin, to join us back up on stage on the, on the panel. Yeah, is this on? Yeah, this sounds like it's on. Great. Um, okay, well, I want to start by thanking all of our presenters one more time. Um, really great projects. Um, and I want to thank Atiyah and David for, um, for being here to think through them a little bit with us. Um, so just to start off, I think one of the things that I observed in um, most of these projects um, is that they seem to both presuppose and respond to a certain tension. Uh, on the one hand, they recognize, I think, the fact of um, uneven geographical development, right? Um, the segregation of privilege from poverty, something that someone like David, for example, has um, gone lengths to, uh, to sort of um, demonstrate and try to explain in his work. Um, and on the other hand, they seem to all be invested in the belief um, that Atia mentioned in her presentation that equity uh, is one of the uh, pillars of government and it's a, one of the preconditions for resilience. And they all seem to me to respond to this tension um, through integration, right? M mainly spatial integration, through putting uh, housing um, in uh, affluent neighborhoods, right? Through um, using landscape to connect spaces, bicycles, um, cruise ships, you know, et cetera. Um, so I think one question that I have that um, we might want to explore is uh, what how do we think about integration, spatial integration, as a response to uneven geographic development, um, as a tool for achieving equity? What, what can presentations like these, projects like these, um, uh, do for us to help us assess the uh, capacity for spatial integration to address inequity? Um, what are the unique opportunities of spatial um, interventions, design interventions, to achieve equity? And what, what might some of the limits to, to spatial interventions be? And so if any of our discussants or our panelists want to open up, feel free. Since I'm hope, holding a mic, I guess I'll talk while we figure out who the next person is going to be. Um, so first of all, thank you all for your presentations. They were amazing and very thoughtful um, in terms of the experience, um, in terms of trying to think about how um, these very difficult situations could be looked at from a different perspective. I think that's the type of thinking that we need in, in order to support um, moving towards equity and really challenging um, some of the current status quo types of thinking and ways of doing business. So thank you all for that. Um, what I'll say is, uh, in res direct response to the question, is what are the opportunities, right? Um, for kind of bringing these pieces together to help address equity. I was actually meeting um, with an organization uh, that is one of the few nonprofit uh, architectural firms um, in the country, um, and we talked actually a lot about this. Um, and we, we talked a lot about how the built environment, the landscape, the open space are manifestations of whether or not equity is present or not. Um, and so 
the opportunity is huge there. And I think you talked, uh, I forget who talked about, was it you that talked about the opportunity maps? Who talked about opportunity maps? You did. You talked about opportunity maps. And so um, getting a better sense of where are those opportunities for us to really leverage this type of, um, this type of approach to uh, making sure that when we walk through a landscape that we've normalized equity um, in meaningful ways, because right now we're in a space where we've normalized inequity. We walk into certain neighborhoods and spaces and expect them to be certain ways and therefore have no desire to change them. Um, and so but that, that's kind of my initial you know, thinking. Um, I'll speak to that a little bit um, in terms of uh, in terms of accessibility related to um, institutions and the people who live near them, which was a topic that was, I think, addressed really um, compellingly yesterday. Um, but again, going back to St. Louis, there's often a level of distrust due to lack of interaction and lack of um, integration um, through people who are maybe perceived as outsiders for coming to an institution. They haven't lived there. They don't know the communities around them. So um, to me, I see the um, public space and the creation of public space, that process is a great way to facilitate interaction that will then kind of um, address the ideas of, of integration that we're talking about. Um. <laughs> I have the microphone now. Um, I guess just uh, to comment on that, I think um, uh, kind of my interest in this whole subject or the idea is kind of, it's, I think it's really unfortunate that we sort of see integration in the U.S. as sort of some sort of utopian idea that, you know, simply living next to somebody else who's not quite like you is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of insane that that's sort of aspirational. I think that should just be kind of normalized at this point. Um, but um, what else was I going to say? I think also, though, in, in St. Louis, though, there are some examples, definitely, of um, some housing developments and CDCs that are actually pursuing some pretty um, realistic and successful, um, you know, approaches. I think my project was a little bit more uh, pushing the boundary towards what we sort of perceive as kind of normative, but um, there's a lot of examples right now. Um, even developments that we want to look at, you know, that are pursuing mixed income housing as a very, very realistic, um, you know, housing model within, you know, uh, a neoliberal capitalist society, you know, that it's something that, that can be done, it's being done, it's very successful, and, you know, I think at this point it's just a matter of kind of copying and pasting. Um, I was just pasting it somewhere that maybe other people hadn't thought about at this point. Uh, okay, <coughs> just a... Um, there, there are a couple of uh, ways one can think about uh, intervening in the uh, contemporary situation, and I think a couple of projects here uh, were suggesting uh, an alternative. Uh, and we might want to think about this strategically. Uh, I have the impression that uh, there's a lot of impulse behind the idea of uh, trying to create what I would call uh, unalienated spaces in a sea of, ice, of alienation. Um, and that can often take the form of a very specific project. And it's a bit like, instead of trying to deal with the whole city or the whole neighborhood, you try to plant a seed that might flourish in some way. And I think the, the, the uh, the theatre was a very good example of, of precisely that kind of intervention. And, and I've seen a whole set of interventions of this kind in, in, in Latin American cities, where, uh, for instance, the pedagogy of the oppressed is a very significant uh, uh, basis for a, a lot of uh, thinking. And there's an attempt to create uh, in various places cultural centers or, or, or workspaces or something like that, which are outside of the norm of society. And by the, the simple demonstration effect of being there, uh, they indicate that another, another future is possible in some way. But 
and, and this, is, this seems to me to be very useful for a group like this because you're probably better equipped to do those kinds of interventions uh, than sort of wholesale, complete social re-engineering of uh, the whole of Boston or the whole of St. Louis or whatever. And, and I think that, that we shouldn't necessarily think that those, uh, those, those seemingly small interventions are I irrelevant. They're not. They, they, can, they can actually be centers from which something can, 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 can really grow. And this can be around many things. In, in Italy, for example, there's been a lot of women's centers that have been constructed uh, in, in many cities that address uh, the question of uh, you know, women's right to the city and, and, and it's done by kind of saying, okay, we can create these secure spaces or these secure possibilities and out of that can come uh, some, some broader kind of social change. Because it seems to me the broader social change right now is, uh, is very difficult uh, to actually confront because uh, the neoliberal configuration of uh, how capital is working these days uh, is uh, uh, taking on things like uh, income streams in such a way and there's such an inequality of income streams and this is a macroeconomic issue which is actually very difficult to engineer at any, at any local, local level. Uh, and uh, since, uh, for example, affordable housing uh, very often depends upon uh, the population having an adequate income stream to support uh, uh, adequate housing provision, but if 50% of the population does not have that income stream, that leaves you high and dry as to what you can do, particularly when you've got you know, states and the federal government and everybody else getting very parsimonious about the kind of monies it's going to release for, uh, for, for, these, uh, for, for affordable housing pr projects. So I think that, 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 that uh, drawing attention to these more macroeconomic requirements to make some of these things work is, is important, but then gets very frustrating. Uh, if you're trying to get things reorganized in a, in a local neighborhood and the income stream is, is zero, I mean, there was the map of uh, Boston, the sort of zero income. Well, if there's, if there's zero or little income uh, stream, it's very difficult then to build uh, wealth and assets and that, side of th that, sort, that sort of thing. So this is a, a macro problem that has to be approached at the macro, at the macro level. But uh, this other way of approaching it, which is to create what I would call the, the heterotopic spaces uh, in a city where, where something different can go on, uh, where people can acquire a sense of identity, uh, can uh, build a sense of recognition of who they are and what they are, those kinds of things. Uh, those, are, those are interventions which in, I, I wouldn't say they're costless, but they're not they're not embedded in the economy in the same kind of way that some other projects. So maybe the trick for the designer is to look for those kinds of projects which are about creating these what I call heterotopic uh, spaces in a, in a sea of, uh, of, of alienation and hope that those heterotopic spaces can, can actually spark alternatives and possibilities. I just want to intervene because I want to make sure that it's very clear about what I was talking about earlier and how it relates. So the importance of tactical urbanism and having these kind of grassroots um, initiatives, whether they're design-based or otherwise, that are meant to create the type of social spaces and exchanges um, that are meant to shift um, the, the, the kind of this, as, as you kind of talked about, the, um, the way marginalized communities are able to engage with one another in the context of a much larger system. And what I'm very clear about is, number one, that I am, uh, I was a Tia Martin before I took this position, and so I took this position not because I needed it, but because I really believed in um, the approaches that have been shown to bore out that really have positive impacts for communities. And so it's not a if or 
kind of thing. It's a, we have to be doing all of it. So the tactical urbanism piece and these, these very brilliant design projects um, and planning initiatives, um, landscape um, initiatives that are really about creating those type of spaces are necessary and we need to make sure that we're also looking at the opportunities that government at the local level can influence because what we've seen uh, as a movement across the world is that a lot of the, the change that can have real meaning for communities can happen at the local level. And so in the context of a much larger macro, there's things we can't do anything about, but there's things that we can do and so that we don't lose hope um, in the traction that has happened um, here in Boston and in, well, I should say, well, we're in Cambridge, but in Boston um, and in and, and some other cities across the world so that we're not parsing things out as being competitive to one another, but as being part of a larger movement in the direction of racial equity and in the direction of addressing kind of the different types of oppression that communities are suffering from. Uh, maybe, yeah, I, I, I have one thing to mention, the, like, first question, um, and uh, um, maybe, how to say, um, maybe, like, uh, take, putting some seed for the future, um, future of the, like, a local community, or, like, a, maybe no other size of this. Um, I, like, a, uh, we, we, I had a teammate, uh, Yushan Ruo, uh, who is not here, but, uh, uh, we discussed a lot about the, maybe, let's say, the quality of the seed, um, um, which is like a, when it comes to like a tackling the real situation or how to respond to the real so, uh, situation of the uh, like a community. Um, like a, we can like a, we can easily say that uh, we we want to we want to hear the voice of the community, um, and uh, which we call. Uh, it does a like a less responsive way to do it, um, but uh, um, like like uh, the more we discuss, uh, more the more we feel that uh, we also need some like a proactive uh, vision uh, as a designer to intervene uh, to it. Like uh, uh, otherwise, um, like uh, it's like uh, we we are gonna just be a uh, um, we are, we are gonna just be uh, not 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 so. Um, we, uh, no, we we cannot uh, put some good good seed to like uh, envision the for for people to to be better to to make better society or to to imagine the better future for them. So that that's what I was saying. Um, so I know a lot of the projects were talking um, about solutions at the local scale of the community or of the neighborhood and individual, but I think that while tactical urbanism is great and we want to be sure that we're approaching everything from both the micro and macro levels, I wonder then what is the what is the um, what are the tools that planners and designers have in then translating these ideas and what is their role in ensuring the translation of ideas so that we can take these tactical you know pieces and then implement them in other places and I I would be curious to hear the students' perspective on how they feel. <laughs> I guess one thing that I is this on? Oh. I guess one thing that I tried to do in my thesis, um, I, I did think about the kind of systematic implementation of this particular design, and um, it's one of those projects that really attempts to span from, say, a single market. How do you design that to facilitate local interaction? Um, and then saying, well, how do we kind of take this as a design methodology and then apply to the rest of the cruise terminals in the world? If the rest of the cruise terminals in the world can be also designed with the mind of local needs and resources in mind, what would that world be like? And I think that could be the extension of the project is to kind of take a few examples and then start to imagine that. Um, but I think maybe other panelists can contribute to um, this challenge of like how do you take something local and then make it systematic. And I think that is 
kind of the strength of our training here as, a des as designers, urban planners, landscape designers. talk into this because I'm thinking about the same thing and I'm always we're always trying to grapple I'm in St. Louis we're always trying to grapple with these kinds of interventions that are productive on a local level for sure um, and we're always trying to figure out what that means in terms of the city's role the state's role the government um, in terms of affecting structural change, right? And I feel like the danger is that while productive are these projects supplementing deficiencies in the system and by, is it a way of legitimating, legitimizing um, or accepting the fact that the system is not uh, as robust as it should be, right? Are we, in a way, um, making it easier, right, for the state not to take care of some of these things by offering these projects, as productive as they are. So I, I feel like there's this tension in these kinds of projects and what that means in terms of the affecting structural change. So if any of our panelists want to address that that issue, that tension, feel free and. We can also continue taking questions. We, you know, we promised questions from the audience earlier. So, if anyone has uh, questions on that, uh, on that theme, or other questions that they'd like to address to our discussants and panelists, please uh, feel free to ask them. Just make a comment on Patty's intervention that I'm answering, but I just want to make a connection between what you've said and what Dr. Martin said about working, simul and this also came up yesterday, sorry, in the St. Louis conference, but working simultaneously on scales at the same time. So rather than thinking it's like either or, you do local, you know, and is that just gonna legitimize, as you said, legitimize uh, neglect on the part of the state? How do we design those local heterotopic interventions in a ways that somehow start a new conversation and connect up? to other scales of governance. I, I think it's really important to think about governance. It's come up a little and having you here is really important. Sometimes I don't think we do enough of that here in the planning program. Thinking about the absolutely central role of officials, elective is not just civil society, we have to actually work with institutions of governance. So the challenge becomes designing, designing projects that can get implemented at a very local level that somehow make authorities take notice or integrate or get involved or change their practices. And so that's yet another it, another layer of implementation, not just getting the project done it's at the, at the space. Yeah, if I could just quickly build on that, I, I agree. And I think in some of these projects, it's kind of students sort of anticip saying what the public sector so, sort of should be doing. So the, in, if you look at Andy's project, for example, that is sort of saying, in anticipation of recent, you know, rulings around fair housing, where the where we're going to finally take seriously our obligation to affirmatively further fair housing, build fair housing where it should be built. Here's some good ideas for sort of how to do it, right? And here's some. I mean, we really didn't have time to go into the design, but uh, there's there's a lot of thought behind where we should locate these these kind these kinds of developments, how much of a mix they should be, what kind of amenities should be built in them, how they should be designed. So it's sort of a provocation in a way um, to, to, to the public sector who, sh who will be doing this. Um, so I think it's not, it's not so much us uh, as designers subsuming the role um, or and in, in so doing legitimizing <laughs> Uh, neoliberalism necessarily, but sort of having a, a productive dialogue with, with with the public sector, who we we know um, we need to implement some of the larger uh, uh, some of these pro some of these projects and to make meaningful change. In addition to the smaller, I think more um, heterotopic kind of spaces, which I totally agree with Professor Harvey are are absolutely crucial and a great thing for students to focus on in studios, um, and I just want to say I'm so glad that this, we're using this as an opportunity to talk about the thing for designers. I think that was a, uh, what we should be doing as students here. We're all in this situation. This came up yesterday, too. We want, we want to design justice. What's the best way we could do it? 
in a 15 week chunk when we're here in Cambridge and people are over there in St. Louis and the people in St. Louis are never gonna see us again, right? And we're not gonna have a sustained kind of commitment and we're not gonna be part of uh, sort of on the ground movement. And so it's really good that we're having this discussion and thinking about ways that we can think about how to do what we do well, given the parameters of being students, of being in school, so on, et cetera, et cetera. And I just wanted to, sorry, I just wanted to add about the, the local context um, around um, when we think about how we frame these issues, that we're thinking about it in a way that uh, is seeing all of us as um, connected and partners in doing this, and that sometimes that the realities of what's happening in, if we're talking about local government, the realities of what's happening in local government and local leadership is sometimes a barrier, but there's a lot of things that you can do around that, because what I've found is that most top leadership, they come and go, but the people who are in departments are with the city for many, many years. And so really understanding what motivates the folks who are in those roles um, in, in, in developing those types of relationships, sometimes it's not possible because they're just not ready. But there are many times where the humanity um, of, of institutions, there's space. And I know that sounds like an oxymoron, the humanity of institutions. But mm -hmm. institutions are just made up of people. And we sometimes forget that. And a lot of, um, especially in government, at least in Boston, the, the government is made up of people who have to live in Boston with, the ex with some exceptions. But so they're residents as well. And so kind of the, that there's this, this natural opportunity to figure out how all that stuff comes together. Thank you. So uh, I may be between us and pizza again, but um, <laughs> let me just make one, one bridging uh, comment from my colleagues and perhaps even uh, the last comment. Uh, and maybe hopefully connecting to the scale issue too, which is translating from a scale issue to a scale of agency. And so in listening to all the projects today, you know, they each talked about a particular um, sort of design as an outcome or intervention or design as process or the combination of them. And I want you to begin thinking about your agency as policy makers too, because I can pick off policy ideas from every single project I just listened to. And so it maybe ties Patty's question too, in that perhaps in the pedagogy of us doing studio work, where you are instinctively thinking about an outcome, right? Um, and in some cases thinking about process, that you might also be thinking about the policy implication of each and every project we saw, whether it's landscape, architecture, planning, or urban design, because in some cases you're starting by looking at what those policies are and you're proposing an alternative. Or in fact, if you were to retroactively look at your work, I bet you will find a policy that might present a barrier to what you want to do. And therein lies the opportunity to actually change that policy. Right? So that is the way you begin to create the translation across geographies, across cities, and even potentially across scale. So then connecting you back to the last comment, which is then also as you begin to go out into the world, see yourselves as people who could actually be that public official. So my career path has taken me from SOM to being a planning director to back out in the private sector. And I went into the public sector with the intention of having that agency on the other side of the table trained as you are. So think about your role as a designer, and I often think of planners as designers too, uh, as process, outcome, policy, and also the different stations and places where you put yourself in order to have that, that agency. Thank you. If there are no burning, there's one more. Okay, and after, after this, we'll head over to lunch and the brainstorming session for Matt. Okay. Thank you. Now I feel really bad between my question and the pizza. Um, I look at designing justice, and one of the things that comes to mind, and I am coming from the real world, uh, is that uh, the issue of uh, inequity in, in cities is paramount in the problem of homelessness. And homelessness is growing in leaps and bounds in uh, many, many cities where uh, it's causing major disruptions, and some cities are taking drastic steps towards it. Um, I know that much of what is happening in the actual process of it is that poverty is big business. So in many ways, uh, developers are embracing the idea of homeless shelters and providing them for cities at great expenses. So where does the designer um, approach this as 
to how to solve the problem of homelessness. Uh, obviously, it's homes, but how do you address that within the construct of ex existing structures that have policies in place, exactly as Tony Griffin mentioned, that are impediments towards out-of-the-box thinking or, in some ways, um, solutions that are uh, mixed uses and have some of the creative ideas that the students have mentioned, they're ways that are they're prevented when you're addressing an issue such as homelessness, and especially in a city like St. Louis or in Boston or in Washington, for example. Thank you. Um, if there are no responses. There are. <laughs> We can talk, Let's you know, during pizza and <laughs> things. Yeah, we're going to have. Um, so just before we let you get pizza, I'm going to ask Lindsay to come back, and she's going to briefly explain um, the um, what Map the Gap wants to do during our pizza lunch. All right, hello again. Um, excuse me while I read off my phone as well. Um, all righty, so we just quickly want to get um, your ideas, your feelings, your concerns around um, hackathons. Um, and so, um, again, we're hosting our hackathon tomorrow, um, and we're specifically looking at Boston, St. Louis, and Baltimore in our research. Um, and we're looking at category, we're looking at the four categories of crime, housing, um, education, and transportation. Um, if, and within all of those things, um, I'm hoping that we could have a scribe at each table to just answer four questions for us, um, speak collectively with a group, with your group at your table, um, and I'll actually type them up on here and present them or um, project them. Um, but the first is kind of how you all individually, what, how you guys define hackathons. Um, if you don't know what it is, put that down. If you think you know what it is, put that down. Um, the second question um, would be, how do you think a hackathon is valuable for designers um, as a tool for participatory engagement? Um, and then, um, then, well, it's three questions. So then the last one would be, um, how do you consider or how do you think data is valuable for designers um, and, and what kind of ethical issues can that bring up when you're studying people? Um, again, I'll put this up. So you can read it as you eat. But if I could just have one person from every table write down the three answers to that, that would be fabulous. Thank you so much.